conducting the meeting tonight. I'd like to welcome everybody out to the North Ogden City Planning Commission meeting for April 3rd, 2024. We are now being held in our new chambers, which is in our new public works or public safety building. I will begin our meeting with an invocation or a thought from Commissioner Bailey, followed which will be led in the Pledge of Allegiance by Commissioner Nan Carroll. Commissioner Bailey. Well, I'm the, <clears throat> I'm the newest member of the planning commission. So I wanna just maybe share a little bit of maybe how I ended up here. Uh, my, my profession, uh, I'm an architect. So I've been on, I've been on the other side of, of these kind of meetings more than once. And uh, it's been interesting to see, um, to see the process between cities and their citizens and their, and their um, personal and private property rights. And I've, I've gotten frustrated in the past when I've wanted to get my projects done or pushed through. And I've, there's been times where I was not a cognizant of the neighbors or the rules, things like that. And so um, it's been good to be on the other side of things to, to see uh, the different perspectives, I guess, people wanting to uh, do what they want with their property and people wanting to ensure that that does not affect what they want to do with their property. And so I've been frustrated with that. And that is how I ended up here on the planning commission. And uh, I think that's just something that I like to keep in mind at these meetings is there are different parties here. There are different, um, desires at stake. But I think the good perspective here is to remember that private property is, you know, more or less kind of a sacred thing. And it's sometimes it's interesting to take a step back and ask yourself the question, does what your neighbor doing affect me or not? And also is what I'm doing affecting my neighbor or not? So I'd like to keep that in mind for this meeting and that's my thought for the day. Thank you. Thank you. Please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America, America and, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, Thank you. Uh, We'll make note that Commissioners Watson and Green are excused tonight. Uh, consideration and action to approve the March 6th and March 20th Planning Commission meeting minutes. Is there any corrections or adjustments that need to be made on those minutes? If not, I'd entertain a motion of approval. I'll make a motion that we approve the March 6th and March 20th, 2024 Planning Commission meeting minutes. Second that. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Uh, do we have any ex parte communications or conflicts of interest on anything on the agenda tonight with any commissioners? If not, let's move on to our legislative items. Uh, at the beginning of the meeting, we'll open up for public comment. If you're here and you'd like to comment on an item that is not on the agenda, we welcome you to step up to the mic and address the Planning Commission. Again, if they're here for not something on the agenda, you'll have an opportunity um, when the item is presented. So if you'd like to address us, please come up to do so now. Or if you're online, raise your hand in the chat. All right, being no public comments, we'll move on to our uh, item number five, the zone map amendment. Is that what that stands for, Scott? Yep. 2024-1, this is a public hearing for consideration 
and a recommendation on a legislative amendment to rezone property for land located at approximately 281 East Pleasant View Drive from Century Farm Zone to multifamily residential R4. Our presenter is Scott Hess, our Community and Economic Development Director. Scott. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, <clears throat> so we have tonight an item. This is at approximately 281 East Pleasant View Drive. This does have an existing zoning map amendment that's been applied on it for the Century Farm Zone. It's a form of a planned residential unit development, small lot, single family zoning. Um, for this particular use, this actually goes back to 2021. Um, from May of 2021, for nearly a year, it was about nine months it took, the developer had requested multifamily, the planning commission, based on information in the general plan and the decision at that time in 2021 had recommended approval of multifamily and it got to the city council and the council had asked the developer to look at other options that would preserve single family in this area. So they produced the small lot single family zone is about 4,200 to 4,500 square foot lots on average. There's 35 of them with two half acre lots left on Pleasant View Drive. And then they went to work to try to sell that project essentially to a home builder and market conditions, costs, interest rates, um, you know, issues on the property itself, a number of things have made that, they've been, had a difficult time. They've been unable to bring that pro uh, product to market. So the developer produced for you in exhibit A, um, a narrative talking about this and the work that they've done over the last couple of years. So I, I hope that you've reviewed that and we can talk more about it. We also have the applicant here to represent the project, <clears throat> but they've brought back a request to look at an attached unit townhome type of project and going back to a rezone. So attached to the packet were three concepts. This isn't a site plan. This isn't any further land entitlements. Those are just kind of visual representations of how townhomes might hit the property um, but it's moving from approximately 37 total lots to like the mid 60s, like 66 to 68, depending on the configuration that they can get there with the grades and the um, setbacks that they're going to need. And when you look at the general plan, this area of the city by general plan designation is downtown mixed use. And that downtown mixed use land category covers Loman View Drive west of the city shops, down south to pick up Patriot Point. Um, it swings east of Washington Boulevard and picks up some small lot single family. And then all of the civic area that we're in right now up through uh, North Ogden Elementary. So there's a wide variety of existing zoning designations within that downtown mixed use land use category, uh, which has you know brought staff to the opinion that R4 is an acceptable zoning category in this greater overall area. Um, <clears throat> when you look at proximities to, there's walkable proximity to an elementary school, a junior high school, two grocery stores, all of the civic uses for the city. These are the areas that by you know professional planning practice make a lot of sense to put some additional density to, you know, it's also on the one and only transit line that North Ogden has and really should expect to have for the next 20 years, which is the bus that comes up Washington Boulevard and swings around our city. So from those standpoints, you know, staff is supportive of a rezone to multifamily. I think that there were some items and some betterments and elements in the original project, including park space and funding for a park that should be retained and that the planning commission should really recommend that those items be retained and held in any further legislative action going forward to the city council. Um, but from just a you know perspective of existing land uses, what makes sense for the city, the highest and best use and doesn't meet the general plan, staff is of the opinion that this, this can be found by the planning commission to be um, recommended to the city council as an approval for a rezone to something multifamily. I'm happy to go into it further. We, we talked a lot about it in the planning commission back in you know, 2021, 2022. It, it was at your desks more than one time. And then also um, two weeks ago, we had a bit of a work session on this. It wasn't, it's not a formal public hearing, but we have talked about it. The developers gone back and looked at some different concepts. That's what you've got the produced three concepts. And um, we've sent out a mailer to those property owners within 300 feet of the project area and hope you know some of those folks have come and as well as their neighbors and you have some 
pretty large lot single family that surrounds this immediately. So that 300 feet didn't pick up probably every affected entity, but it at least has created some awareness and um, staff's looking forward to hearing from the public. And we've had several conversations. I've had several conversations over the last few days with members of the public who live immediately around this. Um, with that, I'll entertain any questions that you have. And we do have the applicant representative here as well as we'll hold a public formal or a formal public hearing. Okay. I may have questions. Yeah, I have one question. Are we going to see a, uh, a map of the zones that are around the area? I know we've, I know we've drilled into this before, but yeah, the, 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 the zone that's immediately to the north and, and to the east and west. And yeah, we can look south. at that. And yeah. I can, we can pull up the zoning map and take a look at what the actual zoning on the ground is. And, and we here. can, if you guys can prepare that maybe for, for discussion portion, we can hear from, I would think that would is be that, okay. Is that the map you have there, John? That's the general, this is the general plan map. And this kind of like, mauve pink color is the area indicated as downtown mixed use and you can see what it what it picks up it's a pretty good swath of the central portion of the city so you have everything from large lot acre legacy single family to our apartments and townhomes um, the mpc zone with patriot point the other small lot single family zoning that um, the same developer had done so Cherry Springs Villas is in this area. It's, that's a, a 55 and plus community of multifamily, but they're single level living, kind of four plexes that are attached to each other. So it's really open as far as what is existing on the land uses. It's not as clear cut that this is one specific type of single family or one specific type of multifamily. It really is made up of several different types of zoning in the area. Okay. Any other questions before we ask the applicant? I do have one question. I did read uh, the minutes from the last meeting where it sounds like there was quite a discussion mm -hmm. on the same topic. But um, you had mentioned that you know a few years ago when we looked at this, we had uh, forwarded a positive recommendation, but then the city council had um, wanted to go in a different direction. Mm -hmm. um, do you recall like what the reasoning was and would would you expect it to be in any different now, three years later? Well, that was my first meeting. I started on May 11th and I think that was May 13th. So I was kind of just listening at the meeting and Rob Scott, the previous planning director had taken that item, but there was a lot of concern about the, um, the amount of change that's happened in this area. You know, it's long been a farmland. It's long been open. These are areas that make North Ogden, North Ogden. So I really understand the residents' concern and feelings of, of anxiety about that change. And I think that that was a big part of it, that, that public, the public hearing portion that people brought their concerns forward. And at that time, <clears throat> we were in a different housing market than we are right now. And we were a different, you know, different interest rate market in 2021. We were still sitting at like three and a half, four percent interest rates. They were climbing, but not hitting the sevens and eights that we're seeing today. So the developer was willing at that point to look at a variety of different housing options. And we went on a tour as staff and we had the mayor, the developer and a handful of staff go out on, and tour some small lot, single family areas and found a, I think a really good compromise in what was, you know, what could be done in the area, but given some specific constraints on this piece of property, you know, a large, a large, constraint that is from Loman View Drive down to Pleasant View Drive, there's significant elevation fall on the property. Um, <clears throat> at one point, you need to bring in something like 10 to 15 feet of fill in order to provide a single lot, like a single family lot that's even remotely flat and has a flat space. So there's a, there's a number of constraints and, you know, given land costs and interest rates, I just, the developer's concerned that they're not going to be able to produce a housing product that's even sellable in today's market, let alone provides for any type of affordability, which we were really hoping to hit the mark in this, in this project. So to answer your question, I, I don't know what the council's opinion will be. Um, developers, the, John Hansen, they started at the council and talked to them and council directed them to come back through planning commission and make a formal application. But um, I, I didn't get as staff a real strong direction yet. And just remind me, R4 would allow what it's, in multifamily? Yeah, it's, to, uh, it's capped at 15 units per acre by code. But when you do the actual density calculations out, it 
that would require like the perfect Goldilocks square piece of property to get it. So you're probably more like, you know, 12 and a half to 13 units per acre. And even that given 300 East and the roadway that they've got to come through with is going to be difficult with what they've got. Um, 67 units is just under 11 units an acre is the density that's being proposed right now, which would fit under the R3 zone, but the R3 zone requires, there's, there's all this math that you've got to do of footprints and, and dividing the property out. And I think it would actually reduce the number of practical units they could hit on the ground. So the R4 allows them to maximize it at just, you know, just between 10 and 11 units per acre. And that's what their request is. Thank you. So I don't know if you remember, we had, a, when we updated the general plan, I remember this property was, you know, when we did a charrette with the citizens, mm -hmm. this might've been the 2015 plan, 15 mm -hmm. update mm -hmm. a while ago. And this area was highlighted by the public with their opinions. So they wrote down on sticky tabs where they think mm -hmm. densities should be. Mm -hmm. And this was an area that was like, you know, that the residents in general that were at the charrette felt like this was a good area to put multifamily That's and what I where recall. should we put it? Yeah. And that was a big driver of updating the general plan and our decision last time to say, yes, let's recommend mm -hmm. positive to the, the zone that they asked for the first time. So, it, you know, right. Thank you. I know that's some of our reasoning behind the last time when we gave it a positive recommendation. And, and did we give a positive recommendation to R4? Yes. Mm -hmm. It was R4, and which is what's being proposed tonight. It was. The first concept that I came remember the forward in 2011 was, it was 80. <clears throat> it, was not, it wasn't townhouses, right? It was, it was 71. Townhouses. Yeah, 71 townhomes. So that would have required R4 at that time. Too. It doesn't matter anyway. It's a zone, right? Yeah. Not a subdivision. Yeah. Give it a few minutes and the sun won't attack you. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Would the applicant like to address us before we just so the public that's here knows the order since this is the first item, the applicant will address us. Um, we will open the public hearing, give opportunity for the public to speak, and then the applicant will have rebuttal time at the end, after which the public will not have opportunity to, com to comment. So we'll invite the applicant to come up and speak. John, if you want to pull up the concept. The I'm John Hanson, 1165 West, 4000 North in Pleasant View. I appreciate the consideration of the Planning Commission to alter this zoning. And as uh, Scott has indicated, the uh, main motivation of this is to provide some affordable housing for young couples. And uh, I had an exhibit, if John can put it up there. It would be that uh, some of the Planning Commission members have seen it. It would be the numbers. I don't know that the number, the numbers were in the... Yeah, we don't have those. I don't know that the cost numbers are in this one, John. I think they were in last times, and I think you just have the design in this one. Both your exhibits. Go tell them. Go off the exhibits. They don't have these. So go just use your numbers on that and then go off. Just go off what we're proposing. The density. <laughs> it's okay. I okay, yeah. John. All right. If we did single family homes, that was the current zoning. The average price of those is between 525 and 530 maybe even up to 540. So I took a number at six and a half percent interest at 530,000. That would put the couple's payment at 3864 a month to buy a hundred and forty thousand dollar home. And they would need an income of 117,000 a year with $500 is all they would allow for extras car payment, refrigerators. That's a pretty tough number. Uh, the couple would have to make 117,000 just to qualify. And uh, to me, that's a, that's a no-go. 
because I the, the couples in Weber County, these younger couples, they're not pulling in 117 grand. And that was the main reason that Geneva and I wanted, and my son Mark could change that to some affordable housing where more people could get in them. So if we look at a, a town home, and uh, I put 390, uh, they're selling for around 400, 390 to 400 anywhere in Weber County. And uh, oh, I forgot to say that a couple would need $30,000 cash to close the single family with all their costs and their down payment. The townhomes at 390, which I'm hoping we can get rezoned, uh, the, at six and a half, the payment would be $2,988, $2,900, which is still a lot of money. And their amount needed at closing would be $23,000 uh, to close an FHA loan on a townhome. So that's really the motivation. It's not the number of lots. It's trying to provide a product that your grandchildren or your children would be able to still stay in North Ogden. I think that's it in, a, in summary. As Scott mentioned, the property is a tough one. It drops 38 feet from Loman View to Pleasant View Drive. And so these different designs we have, we've tried to go from east to west to take uh, to work out that grade. And I'd also like to point out down at the bottom, if John could pull that back down. Yeah, the green there in the bottom, uh, we're donating land for a park, which is a little more than we were going to do because the layout on the single family, we're donating that land plus the city park uh, the city's going to build a new park with ramp funds. Plus we have the retention basin that Eric's working on with the city that would, could also be put into green. We don't have to fence it. We don't, the berms are not, are not that high. So we think that would make a tremendous end or amenity for this project and the community. Now, there's been some concern, well, we don't want any more townhomes. We don't want this. The really only difference between those single family and the townhomes is uh, five yard, five yard side yards. That's what we've already approved. And so I think actually in this one, I haven't had a great base in do it. I think we have more usable green space in this one than we did the, the single family. I don't know what else to to tell you. I would really appreciate the planning commission considering it. Some of the neighbors on the other side of the road have expressed some concern, but these units would be basically the same height as a fa single family. They're two stories. They go up about, uh, oh, what was it, Geneva, 20? 20, 25 to 20 eight feet tall, and that's how tall these will be on the front. And the other good thing I like is those on Loma View Drive, the single family had the garage in the front, and they'd have to back out on Loma View Drive. This puts a rear load where the users are not messing with Loma View Drive, and that will be the front yards, and we will do some uh, uh, amenities uh, along the front there plus some you know some nice architecture on the front would bring that to you so i think there's some real advantages to this for the neighborhood the homes will not be any higher than it's been approved and the rear load and i don't know what else to tell you that's that's where it is but i was just with a young couple or a young fellow today at great basin he's been married two years and I said, where do you live? He says, I live in Layton. I said, well, are you renting or buying? He says, I'm renting. And uh, he said, I don't think I'll ever get a house. And uh, he's paying for his three bedroom. He said he's paying eighteen fifty a month for his three bedroom. And there's, uh, I think we can come pretty close. We're about twenty nine eighty eight, 
but there's tax advantages owning your own home. You can deduct the interest uh, of about 25% of that. I'll put their payment around uh, 2,400. And I think that, I think they could work that out on the 24. So that's, that's our thinking. Any question from the planning commissioner, Scott? I'm sorry we had to run this back through the hopper, <laughs> but the market is horrible. We're 40,000 units short in the state of Utah right now for couples. So, okay, thank, thank you. you. All right, we'll go ahead and open the public hearing. Again, this is for a rezone of the property, 28281 Pleasant View Drive from Century Farm Zone to multifamily residential R4. The public hearing is now open. If you'd like to address us, please come up to the mic and state your name and address. And we'd love to hear from you. Uh, again, just to mention everybody that is here, you're welcome to leave after you make your comments. You don't have to stay through the whole meeting, but those that have been in attendance, please make sure that you've signed in on the, the roll out outside the door there. Eric, everyone has five minutes. Any, any individual oh, comment, public comment is- This is true. Yeah, each individual be, has f up to five minutes. <clears throat> I, I didn't intend to be the first, but it looks like no one else is stepping forward. So I'm Carmen Sinone. I live on Pleasant View Drive. Um, I'm, a, I'm a little ways away from the, the property that's being developed. I also have a century farm. Um, my concern is Number one, the traffic increase with 66 more families or 68. How are we going to handle the traffic? There are times during the day now you can't come off of, you can't come from the west and get onto Washington Boulevard. Whether you're coming on Loman View Drive, whether you're coming on Pleasant View Drive, the traffic's backed up all the way to Alberta. There's so much traffic, you can't make a left turn off of 300. So that was when I heard the number there. How are we going to address the traffic? Because uh, it's difficult now. Um, my other concerns for, for personal is with the walking path the way it is now, the vandalism on my place has increased astronomically. In the last 18 months, my fence has been cut twice. On um, November 28th of this year, someone cut the lock off of my west gate. I reported it to the police the next day and I rechained it. The next day they tried to take the gate off the hinges. So I'm concerned about trespass. It seems like people really no longer respect private property and they see a large area of property and they just assume that, oh, that's public domain. I can go anywhere I want. And I'd like to say it's just kids, but I catch as many, adults trespassing on my property. And I really don't want anyone to get hurt because they don't understand animals or they, or they don't understand the equipment. I also don't want my equipment vandalized, my buildings vandalized. Um, I don't want my stock harassed. And, and that's, so that as a personal level, just it, that much increase, we, I already have that problem. This is just going to increase more of that. Um, so, well, and the other thing is anybody that knows me knows I prefer, um, mountain dog breeds, the Pyrenees and the Aqua, and I would hate to have a trespasser get hurt. Since my, since my fences have been cut, I've been letting the dogs have full run of the property. So just to maintain order and, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with those breeds. They're wonderful, loving dogs, mostly big couch potatoes, until they feel threatened. They will take down a bear, they will take down a wolf, they'll take down a person, and you can't stop them when, once they feel threatened. So I don't want anybody to get hurt, but I don't know how to maintain my property either. Um, and, I, and I do want my property maintained. Now, one other thing I was hoping you could dispel is there's been a rumor going around um, Mr. Hess mentioned the fill that needs to be brought in. The rumor that was going around was that North Ogden was going to provide the fill, not the developer. The developer will, okay, I didn't think that was a fair 
thing to to pass on to North Ogden City <laughs> residents. So, okay, but yeah, if you could explain how we're going to handle the traffic, that would be helpful. I, I know you can't do anything about the vandalism, but I just want to raise the issue that it will increase the vandalism and the trespass in the area for those of us that still have our property. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Council members, um, my name is David Shoup. I own Coldwater Animal Hospital, located on the corner of Pleasantview Drive and, and Washington Boulevard. I live in Liberty. My, my question is I'm looking at your map. I'm not seeing sidewalks on Loman View Drive or Pleasantview Drive. Is that a mistake that I'm this, making? This isn't a site plan for approval. So yeah. this is just a rezone. When they do their site plan, they'll have to meet all requirements. So all those details will be on their official plan. This helps you kind of visualize what, what could, <coughs> could go. There. So North well, Ogden City built a sidewalk along Pleasant View Drive, conveniently abutting my property. And now I'm expected to clean it and accept the liability if it's not cleaned. And I'm wondering if that sidewalk was built in anticipation of this R4 change. Um, it seems hardly fair to put a sidewalk in, expect me to clean it in anticipation of something that may or may not happen. Uh, North Ogden City had an equal opportunity to put that same sidewalk on the south side of that street where it wouldn't have been my responsibility. Um, Chad said earlier, hey, we wanna look at this from both sides, you know, both points of view, from not only the city point of view, but from the residents and the neighbors North Ogden City's put a big burden on me as a property owner to maintain a sidewalk that doesn't even exist on my property. Um, and I think I would suggest fair warning to anybody who is dealing with North Ogden City. It's not all fun and games. Uh, I've had to fight North Ogden City on multiple fronts for what they've done to me financially, and I'm still fighting them. So... Um, I just think there ought to be fair warning to anybody who's trying to deal with North Ogden City on any level at all. Thank you. Good evening, folks. I'm Robert Krupp. I live across the street from this property on 250 East. Matter of fact, if you look on your notes at 281 East Pleasant View, that's my backyard. So you know where I'm coming from. So we talked about traffic already. So 66 units is maybe not 132 cars, maybe two thirds of that for young couples. Everyone not having two automobiles, but that fact alone, plus the people, right? You can do some multiplication pretty easily. So that area, I think we should come to a compromise of some kind and not an R4. I know this is a bad economy. Everybody hates to see this going on. We can gripe all we want about it, but we're gonna have to compromise on what that use is. R2, Maybe it's not what these people want, but at least something that more or less satisfies everybody. We can't have it all. And besides that, just that rural atmosphere is going to be gone. I mean, we, you know, we can't stand on the way of progress. It's something hard for me to say, because I like things the way they are but it's gonna happen. So the other thing about this is two story. This, this was my question. If it was gonna be something like over at the golf course where we got uh, fourplexes, single story, 
pretty quiet area. I don't know how many units over there, but there are a lot. You guys probably do know, someone probably does. If it could be even that would be probably a little more palatable for the people who live over there in that area. So let me look at my notes real quick. I've been trying to keep up with this because I didn't come prepared. I didn't know what to expect. Anyway, <clears throat> I think I'm done. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, fast tax. Hey, uh, what's the, what's the deal on this road? State your Is name and address. County? Name and address, please, for the record. Oh, excuse me. Even though we know Dan who you Carter, are. Carter, North Ogden, 113 West, Tailberta. Okay, now, uh, who's responsible for the maintenance on uh, Loma View Dive? From the point it takes off from 400 east to, to where it drops into uh, Pleasant Hill. Who's, who's responsible for maintenance and, the, and maintaining the width of that road? Because it's really narrow, that road. Well, it's a city road, correct? <clears throat> so the city, I, I, I don't know, you're asking like the snow plowing of the road or? No, no, I, I just... General maintenance. Who who's it belong to? First of all, the road is the city's road. Huh? The city owns. Is it Loman View Drive? Is that what the question was? Well, doesn't that until it meets West Pleasant View? view doesn't that and then it turns over to Pleasant View? The far end of that on the east end belong to the the county. I don't believe so. I think it's all city. I think it's all. So it's all. And John's confirming our public works director. It's spring break, so there's. A handful of people out of the office um but that is a city owned and maintained road all the way the full length of it full length of it well between it turns to pleasant view, pleasant view somewhere it yep. has a pleasant but, view yeah. sir this this works best if, if instead of asking a bunch of questions if you state your concerns outright um rather than try to lead us with questions and things i i've been through a number of these and it it works best if you just tell us your concerns flat out i maintain that road I mow it all the time there along you go. where I my property is on each side of the road. And, and uh, I don't ask the city any help on that. I clean it, clean the garbage up. I get no help from the city, you know. But what, what should I expect, you know? They're going to do it anyway. Maintenance, maintenance still doesn't want to help me. But at any rate... Uh, uh, I just wondered, uh, uh, what's the future of that road? And they're going to keep it at the same width, and they keep adding traffic, because what they did, if you're going northbound, coming across the light at uh, uh, 2600, and you want to go down... Uh, uh, Ple uh, Pleasant View Drive, you can't get on. I mean, yeah, you can't get on Pleasant View Drive. You have to go to Loman View Drive, which throws all that traffic onto Loman View Drive by changing that around. Now, I know why they did it, because you've got all that building going up on the hill. So they, well, we'll just shut it off to, to any of the northbound and make them go cross over onto uh, Loman View to get to Pleasant View. And so they're zipping, constantly zipping, zipping. There. And, you know, it's in its poorly maintained road. And uh, I'm just saying, uh, I've built roads for 40 years, by the way. You don't. I was a state inspector and engineer. So I, I know a little about roads <laughs> after 40 years. So, uh, I, I just think they need to do a better job of uh, uh, maintenance and uh, future design 
of that road because you go around there uh, and, you know, Scadden's property's right there and you make that turn, that sharp turn, and there's uh, there's not a lot of width right there in that road because you got the old house uh, down in the hill, down off the hill, and then you got Scadden's. And there's just not much room. It's a hair, hairpin turn. I mean, is there any anybody thinking the future and fixing that? You know, and I just do what I can, but I'm hoping that you know I'll growl harder if if they don't don't uh, pick up the ball and run with it. You know. So they're just going to give me, well, well, that's where it is. No, no, I'll growl harder. So work on the future on that road because it's, it's just too narrow in places and is poorly maintained. <coughs> so that's that's my comment. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Commission, just as soon as you get past 160 East and the Scadden home, it is technically county road. We do plow it. Um, but we're not responsible for it, it as it's in the county's jurisdiction. About right on that corner. Well, that was a fair question. I stand corrected. <clears throat> Any other comments? Make a motion to close the public I think, hearing. We, I think we have someone coming up. Oh. Questions. I'm con my name is Kay Johnson, and I live on 200 East in North Ogden. <coughs> I'd like to know how this is going to affect um, the children that will eventually be there, the, the children that will eventually be in those homes. Um, I know that it is very busy on Washington Boulevard, and the junior high and the elementary school in that area are across Washington Boulevard. And I know they have problems now getting back and forth. And I think that's something that needs to be addressed. I think maybe single family homes would be a better idea in that area. And I also wondered how it's going to affect the value of homes that are already built, like my home a single family home, if we put in high density. And is that going to open up the area for more high density homes? And also the street width in uh, the new places that are supposed to be built. I know that the, the streets in Cherry Springs are narrow enough that when one person wants to back out of their garage, they have to back across the street and into the next door or into the neighbors across the street driveway in order to make the turn to get out onto the street itself. I uh, think that will be a problem eventually all the time, unless you're going to make that. Um, um, 55 plus or something like that. I just can't see that many people living in that area and, and being able to live a, a life that they would like to lead. And those are my concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner, are you going to allow? You can make a comment. Sorry about that. <clears throat> State your Any name. Any idea again. when a vote is going to be taken on this, or when the consideration is going to be settled? Any we idea? recommend a planning to City Council, and then City Council will hear it. Usually, like the second meeting after. So yeah, it's usually it about a like month. We we skip a meeting, otherwise the staff report would have to be written tonight for the next meeting. So it's always skip at least one meeting. So the earliest that this would be heard by city council would be um, the 23rd of April. It may be on that day. It may be May 14th. It depends okay. on, on that. Thank you. Thank you. 
while he's coming up, I'll make a clarifying statement to that. This is the second time we've we've looked at this before. You can come on up. Um, uh, this came before us a few years ago, as was stated in there, and we made a recommendation. It was not approved by the city council. Now it's back with another application, which is which is the applicants do right. Yeah. So, thanks, <clears throat> Jerry. <clears throat> Jerry Shaw, two two eight one North, five two five East, in North Ogden. Just a question for you, Scott. I on the letter I received. It said um, the hearing will be held to receive comments on zoning map amendment 2024-01 for the application to rezone property approximately 281 East Loma View Dr or Pleasant View Drive, parcel number 18055-0044 and my acre. 18-048-0045. Is my acre on this to be rezoned also? No, but your acre is is uh, included in, well, let me choose my words right. Your property, property was sold to you before the subdivision plat was recorded. And so the city and the developer have been working together on what the resolution is for the improvements along Pleasant View Drive as it was associated with the original approval of the subdivision, which was two half acre lots and the remainder small single family. So we have a bit of a, there's just an issue there that while your property isn't included in the rezone or wouldn't necessarily be, and you, you as a property owner of that other parcel would say, no, I'm actually not a part of it. It's all sort of rolled into one because it was originally entitled together as Century Farm Zone. So your your remaining acreage is, it might be left as R2, but, or sorry, RE20, but it would have required the subdivision plat to be recorded in order to leave those two half acre parcels there, your one acre. So we need to, we need to do something at the site plan level or subdivision level to clean up the leftover property, basically. Okay. So if mine, if this rezoning went through, mm -hmm and I was rezoned, would that be an advantage to me? You could potentially be R4 as well. Yep. Okay. So. Um, as I look back on this, um, in an ideal world, we wouldn't be here and I wouldn't have sold my land to Johnny. But, um, you know, I had a friend in Wyoming and he said, um, if I can't take it with me, I'm not going. He's gone, but the land's still there. And so I had to make a choice. I view this, I, I've been able to enjoy the property also in the last couple of years, just by, you know, watering and keeping the grass cut and stuff like that. But I view this uh, property as kind of a showcase for what Johnny wants to do. Um, as I drive down Washington or 400 East going south and I look past that car wash, I don't like what I see there. You know, we see all those apartments, those four level apartment houses. I think Johnny has a different plan for this. And um, he and Mark are tied into North Ogden. You know, one lives in Far West, one lives in Plus View. But I think they want to keep a good reputation here. And I don't know if um, R20 or R4, which is the better plan, but one thing I know is that they will do a good job regardless of what they do. They've been very fair with me. And I think he's got a plan to make things look as nice as possible. So when you drive down Washington and you look to the West to see all those, hopefully as you drive back along Pleasant View Drive or Loma View Drive, you wouldn't have the same kind of feeling. 
you'd have a nice feeling that this is a good project and it, it is, uh, you know, for the benefit of other people. And really, it's so close to everything in the city that it won't, It should be good. It should be really nice in order to uh, have it there. So, um, you know, I can't say which is the best, but I, I can say that I think they would do a really good job regardless of what they would do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have anybody online, John? Uh, no raised hands. Okay. Last call for comment. Make a motion to close the public hearing. Second that. We have a motion and a second to close the public hearing. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. So, uh, so I'm sorry, um, Nicole. You made the motion, and who seconded? Brandon. Thanks. We would. Before we open up for discussion, we'd invite the applicant, if you'd like to get up and say anything uh, against public comments, you can. You don't have to. Well, I appreciate my neighbors coming out and uh, expressing their concerns. The traffic was a problem in someone's mind, but I think with the uh, front yards on Loma View Drive that won't have the issue she was talking about. There'll be no cars backing on there. I would also think the people that are going to live there, I don't think they're going to access the majority of them on Loma View. They're going to come along Pleasant View Drive or 2700 and then turn up to their to their home. And I would think the same when they go to work, they're not they don't work to the east or to the north, they work south and go around. And uh, we did us uh, when we did that pheasant landing just down the street, we did a traffic study. There wasn't any problem and could still handle more. So I, I think that's a, an issue that as the, as the road is widened, we'll have to widen it. And as it, it, it'll just get better down the road. And I, I don't know what else to tell you. We'd, uh, I appreciate uh, the confidence that some of the neighbors have in me. I've been developing in your city for 30 years and I've, I've left my fingerprint here and they've all been good in my opinion. So I think the developments uh, are a credit to the city. So I'd appreciate your consideration to make that change that to an R4. Thank you. Let's go ahead and open discussion with commissioners, any discussions, recommendations? A couple of things that highlighted the public was, uh, you know, traffic as, as the applicant had stated and a couple of people had talked about, it does, you know, they will have to meet city requirement, you know, whatever Loman View's road design is, they'll have to widen their side of it to meet that. I believe 300 East is a, collector road right so it's a wider road 66 66 foot, foot right away street. Yep. versus our standard <clears throat> excuse me our standard 60 um the long range traffic plan if commissioners will remember is 300 is supposed to go up and connect to alberta and kind of be another north south um i don't want to say arterial road because that sounds like it's really busy but but uh there's also uh, anticipated to be a new intersection with a light. Um, is yeah. it the road behind Lee's? Is that 300? Or yes. Like so I know years ago, UDOT has approved that intersection for a light once traffic count warrants that. So if anything, this would actually help that to solve the traffic problem that's behind there now. A light at 2700. A light at 2700 and 300. I would anticipate when the new credit so, union comes across the street there and all that, that'll probably... So I don't think we're too far away from getting a light there. It's also I know we good tried that there's to get both a north and a widen. south access too. That yeah. should help with yeah. traffic yeah. flow. Yeah, you know, my my uh, my brother lives in that area uh, just south of this project. And he's, he's neighbors with these guys and I've, I'm there a lot. And my, my sister-in-law was adamantly opposed to this 300 East segment being built. 
and you know to the extent that I've, I've proposed that or suggested to her many times we should cap Pleasant View Drive and not let it connect to Washington right and she was adamantly opposed to that she's absolutely come around to that because she needs to traverse and get from this neighborhood uh, and it's south it's the, what they used to call the ranchettes it's what you know abuts the the 55 and older community that's where they live and she needs to get her kids to North Ogden Elementary and she doesn't have a great way to do that right now without going all around. So she's actually excited for 300 East. Um, I think 300 East is an asset to the community. Yeah. Right. In my, in my, and sorry to go on here, but in my opinion, this is a question of, you know, what density is, is, is right for this, for this area. And um, it's a tough area because it, it abuts supermarket, uh, the old fire station, and then some really big estate type homes. Right. So what transitions from the estate type homes to the more, um, you know, uh, commercial district of, of North Ogden, what transitions? And I don't know as we have a great answer for that, but I do, I do like this plan more than I liked the previous concepts. Um, for one, it gets the um, front doors off of 300 East, which I thought was, was, was poor, really. I never liked that. And I brought that up in the previous design. And I know we're not approving, we're not looking at a, a subdivision plat. We're looking at a zone, right? how many units per acre is right for this area. And I, I did enjoy the, or I did appreciate the comment when someone brought up just the question of R2. Uh, could, could I be reminded of the difference between R2 and R4? Uh, so we're looking at about uh, roughly 13 units an acre with an R4 designation, right? I know it's 15, but practicalities. The sample is 11. The sample is 11, okay. So R, yeah, R2 would be attached single family or it'd be duplexes basically. And there are some lot requirements there. You have to have um, 6,000 square feet per unit. I can run some calculation to tell you what the density would be I mean, be there. density now, it's, it's approved already for 40, was it 40 units? It's 30, it's um, 35 small lot and then two larger lot were on- so 37 place. units yep. and we're going to 60 potentially or 66. Okay. One other high level comment before we get into the details is uh, I, I don't, I don't love when we start talking about economics and, and, and I mean, I definitely want to hear those things and it's, it's, it's compelling evidence in a, in a decision. I don't think it should be the overriding evidence that we, that we take because market conditions, prices that they fluctuate. And I just remind the commission, in my opinion, what we want to design is a good city uh, not to tailor to the, the song of the day and, and that market conditions are such today because these structures that are going to be built are not, they're going to outlast interest rates and home prices and even supply and demand. So where that's, where that is compelling evidence. And I appreciate the, the input because it's something I am considering, but I don't want it to be the thing, at least in my head. So commissioner Mason, <clears throat> you, this yeah, property is 5.57 acres. You multiply that by 43, 560 per square feet per acre. And then R2 requires 6,000 square feet per unit. So you divide that back out and you get 40 units per acre. So R2 yes. would net 40 units per acre. Not per acre. I'm sorry, 40 Four, units 40 total. Units total. <laughs> 40 units total, about, yeah, 40 units total. As so, opposed to this but conceptual 67. Yeah, it's, 60, yeah. it's 62, I counted it on this concept. And then there was a question about Cherry Springs Villas. There's 84 units in Cherry Springs Villas. That's on 15 acres. So that rounds out to just under six dwelling units per acre. Okay. Regarding, regarding the, the, the a couple of issues I wrote down here, because I, I did listen to everything. And, you know, one thing we talked about was, uh, was traffic and I have a lot of thoughts on that. Um, but also, you know, I think there was an underlying sentiment with almost everyone. That how does this impact my home value? Right. And that's, to me, that's why that, that transition is so important because, this is just a place where we need to transition from these estate type homes into a residential area. And that's, that's tough. It's, it's, I think it's, it's tough, but I'm and, and right next to that is commercial right next to that is commercial. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah, it really is a transitional area. I think um, commissioner Thomas put it well when he said, Hey, when the, our charrette, this is by and large, the public that showed up and gave input, um, you know, putting dots on a map, designated this as, as a higher density area. And I think that is <clears throat> also compelling evidence. Um, overall, I think my, and we, we, I have more things we can get into if you'd like, but um, overall, I, I think I am in support of the um, proposal. 
I do have some concerns with it, but I think overall, I think it, it probably has more pros than cons. Uh, it's kind of where I'm at right now in my head. Since you asked my opinion, since nobody ever asked my opinion. <clears throat> Any other discussion items or, I mean, I, I agree with, I go back to the, all the discussion we already had on it once before. And it is, you know, when we, all the buttons we want to hit when we're designing community, you know, walkable, this, the higher density closer to the downtown areas that make, make it be able to be accessible for people who can walk to the store and different things like that. This is kind of ideal for that. Um, the one thing I will say on the value that it does, although that's not, I agree, that's not a reason to change a zone is because market times are tough but the value of home and affordable housing is why we create the zones and why we try and create a community the way we do. And so, you know, when we look at the whole point of saying, you know, like the charrette and the general plan is we need all different housing types in the city and where would we like those? The reason we need the different housing types is because we need the different levels of affordability. So then it goes, okay, we need those. Now, where should we put them? And that's where, that's where that plays in, you know, not necessarily, you know, it's hard times right now, so people can't afford houses. So what can we do different? As, as housing prices continue, it's going to be, how do we fit more people on less land? You know, mm -hmm. that's going to be the continual thing for as long as North Ogden is a city because it is everywhere else. It is. But, and that, that was, that was raised by an individual that how will children have the life that I had in these, this type of homes? And, and they won't, the reality is that they won't. I think you're right on that. Um, but would they, in another community. I, I think the world has become more crowded around here. And I just don't think everybody's going to be as fortunate as we were yeah, to have that. Sadly. Get it the other way. Their kids can have walk services that they're walkable to, but used to not. It's true. Them. My wife grew up on a, on a real, in a real, really rural farm. And she had to start driving at age 12 so she could take the family suburban to her, her friend's house that was, you know, two and three miles away. Uh, true story, probably illegal, but <clears throat> Yeah. But I, I remember when Smith came to town, I was a little, little kid, yeah. but you know, the city has changed a lot since then. So it's obviously not going to go back to, I went down and rode a motorcycle around the land where the old Smiths used to be, mm -hmm. but uh, um, you know, a lot of things have changed, but, but again, going back to the zone, I, in my opinion, I think this, this works well. I thought that before, and I was opposed to the single family use just because of, I think the knowing the topography and the difficulty, I would rather see a project be successful and viable for the community than something that is tried to, you know, a square peg in a round hole just because that's what some other people wanted and they're trying to make work, you know, and I think they made a good effort, but uh, listening to what the council wanted. I like the fact that it's still two story, which is, you know, the elevation is no more than the last proposal of the single yeah. family development, you know. Eric, I think you bring up a really good point there. I think trying to force a round peg into a square hole, you could end up with cookie cutter houses. And that that would be very difficult for the people who have these large custom homes on Lone View Drive. If there is, you know, a the ability to have them be just a little bit nicer i think it'll make a better project and people will be interested you know happier at the end of the day johnson in, years ago sorry to cut you off doing that and it's it's but it's hard it's really hard it's hard to you know it's hard hard to figure it out years ago i was having a conversation about some townhomes that were being built in the city and i was very anti-town home and uh my neighbor kind of cut me off and he said it's not that the residents of north Ogden hate townhomes and i thought oh yeah yeah they do he said no they don't want crap right? They don't want cheap, cheap construction. It's not necessarily a townhome that I think people object to. It's cheap, cheap, poor construction or poorly planned neighborhoods and things like that, because there really is high-end townhomes that enhance a neighborhood. Now, I don't know how we legislate for that in this, but. I think sometimes that's where you have to take a look at who's doing the projects. Mm -hmm. And, and, and yeah, I can't but, say, you know, enough yeah. is said about Hanson's and that, but and it's not to say they're going to be the ones to build the project. You sure. have to be aware of that. Right. But, you know, there is something to be said about let, 
realizing who's doing what with projects and relying that there's some thought that goes into it and not just, well, Hey, we can get 15 units to the acre on this. Let's get 85 of them in there then yeah. and try and just kick it to whoever's going to pay the most money. But if the you zone, know? yeah, if the zone is so tight that the economics end up creating crap because you, it's the only thing that pencils, you know, it's the only thing that can be sold. If, if there's some room for a local developer to be like, Hey, I actually do want to do a nice project, but it's got a pencil so that they can do a nice project. You know, it's, it's yeah. that's hard though. It's really hard. I mean, if, <clears throat> if you just kind of think about who's going to be, you know, potential buyers here, I think having higher quality construction or nicer materials is, is fairly obvious because I think most people who are going to be purchasing these townhomes, you know, mom and dad or, or some family member that wants, you know, their growing family to be nearby. I, I think it's going to drive the price up a little bit, but I think it's also going to warrant, you know, nicer construction to, to, I don't know, to create a pro a, a product that's marketable for, for that segment of North Ogden. I just don't think there's going to be very many units here that don't have that reason behind it of, Hey, my kids, my grandkids, I want them nearby, but I don't want them in my basement. Let's help them get into their first home. That's a lot, you know, so I've done, I've done work on a lot of, on a lot of townhomes in, in, in Syracuse down in Ogden. And while I am quite picky about some of the decisions people make aesthetically, none of them have been cheap or, um, I just didn't like, I didn't like them personally as an architect, but I don't think any of the quality or anything has been cheap. I've been in the last five years, I've probably done 300 with different people and yeah, they've just turned out quite well. They, they, it changed my opinion on living in a townhome. So I think the trend is there. I think, um, quality it's mostly dictated by the building code anyway. You know, the house is not going to fall down. It, it's going to be inspected, things like that. So I don't see it as much of a concern. Is it possible that we could recommend retaining the requirements for open space and like the park space contribution that's in the current development agreement along with the rezoning? Yes, yeah, it's yeah, a recommendation. And, and I believe, is this the concept have that in it already? Yeah. So I think they said it exceeds, said, it exceeds the they previous said they kept what was well, originally. Everything on the bottom right that well, in this concept that yeah. Mr. Hansen, yeah, but, so but would, would it carry over with the you old? Can say, hey, we want it to make sure that it, yeah. the concept that's proposed shows that. But do we need to include that, that in any motion yes. recommendation? Yeah. So that goes and to I think the that's important here. I do too. I because think there's a voice of, yeah. of residents in the city saying, hey, we want, right. I mean, it's the main, not going to be a farmland, at least a little bit of space will help us help this be a little more palatable. I think the biggest advantage from going back to townhomes, just like when we saw the original, when we recommended originally is to me, the biggest thing is the traffic flow and how much better a townhome project enables that to work because you don't need to put driveways out onto the main thoroughfare, yeah. both Loman view, Pleasant view and 300 East, like this design. And we can follow that design through is showing we don't have cars backing out or pulling out, you know, onto those roads off of a driveway. And so for the long-term traffic plans for the city, you know, how much better can some of our main collector roads be if, you know, we have less driveways going on to them right. and they're fed off of, you know, alleyways or arterial driveways, um, you know, and so that, to me, that's a big proponent because it keeps flow on Pleasant View and Loma View Drive, you know, essentially uninterrupted with, except for at main points of access. And uh, so I think, I think that helps when it's the single family, you know, that's unavoidable. <clears throat> and I think you're right. I think, I think if it is single family in 20 years, when the road needs to go all the way through, you're going to be dealing with my kids play, you know, my driveways there, things like that. So <clears throat> I would say that it's just a good point that that's a strength of the development is that the side, the side driveways to the, to the units are, where the cars are pulling out. Oh, yeah. really. There's two, there's two, there's four points of access too, if you count east and west instead of potentially, you know, there's a subdivision I think uh, Johnny did <clears throat> down the road a bit. 
you know, there's 15 or 16 houses on each side of the road where, you know, kids or traffic can be coming out. So I do think that's a, a great strength in the traffic discussion. During the work session and tonight, it's been talked about the rear entry garages. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to make that a part of our recommendation and have it stick? I mean, it's just a zone change. So I know it's been part of discussion, you, but you I, can I always think. recommend because they can, the council will be the ones that rezone it, yeah. but there can be conditions put on it just like that to say, Hey, we don't want driveways on the Loman view is uh, yeah, you can do it. And, you could make that recommendation. It would, it would have to be part of the development agreement in order to make it stick. Cause there's nothing in the R4 code that necessarily requires rear load garages or restricts garages coming off of any major thoroughfare. Um, but councils have you know broad latitude in those legislative decision-making pieces. So if that's part of your recommendation and then just practically on the site, the way the land falls, um, it would be so much more expensive to try to put those driveways off of Loman view because you'd have to build all that land up and, you know, retain it essentially for a driveway as opposed to in these cases, from what we understand with meetings with the developer and the engineer, is that the townhomes almost act like a retaining wall for Loman View and then that's rear entry garages down below. Um, and then just two quick points to address items just because we have talked about traffic is one, you know, to, to a large degree, cities like North Ogden, size of cities like North Ogden, we don't build road. We don't, we're not really like foot forward on infrastructure. We partner heavily with partners like UDOT or Weber County or other, you know, regional grant opportunities for transportation funds when you have an existing road with no redevelopment possibility and you widen it like Washington Boulevard. I mean, that was several million dollars of federal transportation monies, as well as a significant lift from the city saving years for several years of capital improvement projects to widen Washington. But as far as I know right now, we don't have a capital improvement project on Loman View to widen it from county land to 400 East and you pick up incrementally pieces of your widened road and transportation network through developments like this. So Pleasant View Drive and Loman View, that area in front of 150 East at Pheasant Landing, the area around Cher Cherry Springs Villas, like we, the only reason we have sidewalk curb gutter, full road width improvements in those areas is because of development. I mean, developers effectively build your city and then they turn the keys over to you by accepting it and the city maintains it in perpetuity. Um, so there's a bit of like a but for argument in the transportation thing that we're really not going to get any improvements on Loman View unless there is development happening or the city decides that we're going to, you know, take pothole monies and other road funds and other capital improvement projects away from the rest of the city, the balance of the city for maintenance and focus on building this one road. So that's just something to, you know, to take into consideration in the rezone is that that that's a way that cities pick up new infrastructure. Um, and for Dr. Shoup's point, this would have sidewalk, you know, the HOA or the homeowners adjacent to it will have to maintain that sidewalk, just like everybody else. Sidewalks exist in the road right of way. Nobody owns, you know, their sidewalk proper. Everybody has property that abuts that sidewalk and then sidewalk park strips curb gutter are all in the public road right of way, but we all maintain them, snow plow them, sweep them, you know, really do everything outside of like replacing panels for ADA access. Um, you, you know, it's kind of an expectation with the community. Thanks. Well, any other, any other discussion or to entertain a recommendation? I'll make a motion that we <clears throat> recommend to the city council to approve this requested rezone from Century Farm Zone to R4, but also that we recommend some this with conditions that a development agreement also, um, that we recommend that the development agreement retains the requirements for open space and the park space contribution that is in the current development agreement. And also the recommendation that no driveways would come off of, third, of 300 East. We say 300 yeah. East and, and Loman Pleasant View. View Drive and Loman View Drive? 300 East, Pleasant View Drive, and Loman View Drive. Mm -hmm. okay. Am I forgetting anything that we talked about? Okay. I don't think so. Before that's seconded, 
uh, can I get a clarification on the development agreement? Are we, do we currently have a development agreement on this property? We do. Mm -hmm. Okay. And until, until there's a change, you, we have a development agreement and a, an approved preliminary subdivision plat. So until the developer makes application to change that entirely, those, those requirements are all, they stick, they run with the land effectively. So what would happen is the new project would come in, the rezone would happen, the development agreement would transfer then to the elements of the new project, and then it'll run through the standard administrative process. Once you have a zone, then it's just a, a meeting with the planning commission for subdivision and site plan for multifamily. So you'd have the opportunity to review the subdivision for all underlying requirements, as well as um, site plan for landscaping, lighting, parking, all of those. Okay. Items. So, so now is not necessarily the time to put addendums into the development agreement to, to not have crap. Is, um, is no, <laughs> this is, this is the time to do that. I think that, you know, we're, it's a tricky balance and yeah. it's a tricky balance because state code, what the state legislatures are trying to do is provide for more affordable housing. And they say that, you know, all these elements that we as cities require lead to less affordable housing, which is true. Like we, and we don't really legislate against ugly, like for single family homes, if somebody wants to put a really ugly single family home up and it fits in our building box and requirements, we can't, we can't say no. Um, so you could do that and make that recommendation, but just know that I think cities generally, and it, there's a sensitivity to that, that every additional bar you're putting on there affects the underlying housing affordability. Yeah, but where this zone is stuck right up against existing, I mean, it's it's not, we're not building on the outskirts of our city. This is building, <clears throat> this is infill. And, and it's, you know, there's interested homeowners that abut it. And, you know, I, I don't think in my wildest dreams that we're going to get crap there. I really don't. And can I use that term in here? I don't know. Um, I, I, I think the quality of the housing, housing is going to be nice, but you know, there's some, definitely some, some, some fear and concern in the room. And uh, um, you know, I, I, I don't have any, anything to add to that development agreement, but I would just suggest that if somebody did and was passionate about something architecturally or, or something that maybe that, that could be suggested here. You know, I just, <clears throat> I just run into too many differing opinions on aesthetics of, of buildings that I think, crap or beauty or elegant or lovely building is going to be hard to enforce because like, everyone's, I mean, I drive around in my style, everything I see kind of bothers me, you know, even the high quality stuff. So, you know, but people don't like my aesthetic. I just think, I think, I just think that's too arbitrary. It's, it's too, it's too open-ended. Um, yeah, I know. I, know, I have nothing to, to add there, but I, I was just suggesting that, you know, that's, that's some, some way to try to help that, mm -hmm. that aspect of fear and, and concern that was expressed, which is real and, and, and was heard. Um, you know, I mean, the most I've seen is, is, is limitation on, on materials, right. You know, hard surface materials, uh, the types of siding, you know, no metal siding, things like that. I think that can be consistently enforced, but in terms of, do you like that? I don't, but you know, other people do. So I would, I would be hesitant to put any aesthetic restriction on, on the vote today. I second the motion that's made. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Commissioner Webb. Yes. Mr. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Nancaro? Yes. Mr. Mason? Yes. And I vote yes. Thanks for all the discussion and involvement on that. I know we, I, I applaud the commission of always vetting out these decisions and recommendations of the city council. I hope they pay attention to that and recognize, especially as this is the second time through when we've come back with the same result we had last time, um, feeling that this is the, the right thing for the city and for the future of the city. Uh, item number six, zone text amendment 2024-5. This is a public hearing consideration and recommendation on a legislative amendment to consider amending the North Ogden Code Title 11-9M-8D4 accessory buildings to remove the required 412 pitch roof pitch for accessory buildings over 200 square feet in floor area. 
Our presenter is Ryan Nunn, our planner. Ryan. Thank you, commission members. Um, yeah, so just uh, a little background that for this item is <clears throat> the applicant um, last year, they had a, they applied for a building permit for an accessory uh, pool house um, that was approved. It show it did show a 412 roof pitch. Um, later that fall, building inspectors noticed that the design of the building had changed, um, including that that roof pitch. It was changed to a more more flat roof. Um, we uh, so the applicant is seeking to you know they 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 want to pursue that that revised building plan. Um, and so they're they're looking to change this requirement on on that for that size of accessory building. Um, you know, staff looking looking at the code, looking the intent of our accessory buildings and of the design and materials. You know, we we you know there's an argument for four twelve being. Um, you know, meeting that intent of, you know, not intruding on your neighbors, uh, but, you know, looking at building code, the things that really, those standards that go towards what's, what's needed for buildings, we see that there are, there are, it is allowed, you can have those lower roof pitches um, to meet the required snow loads and, and wind speed um, standards. So really we, um, really, you can go both ways on this by leaving it or or removing it. There, you know, there are standards there. If it is removed, that they they have to meet to provide, you know, that it'll be safe for people as well. Um, so, uh, really, staff, you know, once the we leave it up to your discussion on on whether this will still meet that that code's intent to protect neighbors, but also protect the, the owner, the owner's right to build that, that building. Can I give just a, one more little piece of background? So these, all of these standards, so buildings over 200 square feet had st the standards that it needed to be a 412 roof pitch, a one foot eave, could not be metal clad and had to match the house. And so these, these standards all went in during Rob Scott's tenure here as the planning director. And as you know, you've seen for the last three years, accessory buildings are one beauties in the eye of the holder, beholder. Sometimes it's uh, financially driven. You know, we can get a steel building and get our equipment protected for less money. So this has been a bit of a swinging pendulum here. And I think that the original intent when these codes were put in was a a bit of a knee-jerk reaction to a significant amount of pushback in a neighborhood when a metal building came in that was like a standard 312 roof pitch. I don't know if it was a Cleary building or a Roper building or something like that, um, that at the time met the building code. And we had some neighbors come out and say, well, these should really be built to a, a different standard. But as we've administered the code, what we've noticed is in some ways it has killed creativity for people with their accessory buildings or it's you know, made many existing accessory buildings that I think people would objectively say look nice, like a barn style with a steep roof in the center and then a flatter roof on the sides, effectively illegal to build because you might have a two and a half or a 312 roof pitch on those side wing walls. And um, that doesn't make them less safe. You know, Building code is still going to require those things to hold the snow load and, and make sure the building doesn't fall down. But it has been, a bit of a difficult one in some cases for staff to administer, for the public to accept. And it's kind of been, in my opinion, really over the last three years, waiting for an applicant to just come forward and say, you know, we want to be able to make our buildings in some ways match our house, which is what has happened in this case. You have a long, flatter roof that, you know, for whatever reason, building was changed in the field and building department flagged it. And we red tag the building effectively. So it is, you know, we can try to legislate aesthetics. This is legislating aesthetics. Um, and from a staff or like from an actual planning professional opinion, there really isn't a hard, a hard fast rule on what 
the building should be because you could build a flat roofed building and have it be just as safe and still shed water and do everything that it needs to do from a building perspective. Some people might like it. Some people will hate it, but it's really up to you and what you want to do, you and the council. So we do have the applicant here to represent the item as well. And thank you, Ryan. I didn't mean to. Thanks, Scott. Stuff. Ryan, you'd mentioned that, you know, uh, one thing about protecting the neighbors and what I struggle with why it even matters what the pitch roof is on a how because to me if we're saying hey we want to protect the neighbors on a roof pitch then we should say a 412 is a max not a minimum because we're wanting to reduce you know everything else that we deal with as far as accessory buildings is not blocking a neighbor and not blocking somebody's view or impeding on them and then we have this one little piece in our code that says, well, but you have to build it this tall. You know, we have all these limitations and you can only go this high. It has to be so far away from property line. But then you have this one little thing saying, hey, I want a 12 foot tall building. Well, you can't do that because you got to put a four foot tall roof on top of it. Well, I'll do a flat roof. Oh, well, we have this little sentence in our code that says you can't. So to me, it kind of seems a little bit like it's fighting with all the rest of the reason of our code for accessory buildings is for the protection of neighbors and, and view shed, whether it's below, above, next to, or, or whatever is, I think being able to have a lower pitch roof probably lends more to helping the neighbors than, than requiring a certain pitch. So I just wondered, you know, where, where the logic was or what, I know some of it is, you know, the history and, and, you know, I'm on my third planning person in the city so and you're never leaving i've seen that i've seen the opinions and personalities of each one of them and i would agree that this kind of just appeared in there as we were as we were making things but i've also seen was it regulation was it intended to match the home though in other words do we have a 412 requirement on on the homes is this for a specific zone i don't even know a home it's, doesn't have a yeah, it's, yeah a, okay. it's everywhere and there's no Which, state code a few years ago stripped out all of our ability to legislate aesthetics on single family homes for the reason that developers, the building community came back and said, cities are causing houses to be more expensive and costing us time and money in our reviews. And so where we used to say, you've got to be 30% rock or stucco or a limited limitation on vinyl siding or everything has to be purple or whatever, you know, we had cities that had some really hardcore codes from aesthetic standpoint, that's all gone. So a, a 312, is a manufactured home they're you know they're based on they need to go down the highway they're a limited height they're kind of built that way so if you think about what a a low roofed rambler you're probably looking at like a 312 roof pitch so i think 412 was sort of like plucked out of the air to say well it doesn't look like this thing that we all kind of think isn't maybe what we want our accessory buildings to look like so let's make it look like this thing over here um I, that's honestly all I can think of. I don't know why 412 was chosen because there's 6,000 structures in North Ogden, single family structures with, I, I would love to see what the bell curve of the roof pitches are in North Ogden, because <laughs> maybe that's the number we should choose. But. <laughs> yeah. I mean, mo I'm just guessing, but mo most uh, asphalt shingle manufacturer specifications want a 412 or greater. <clears throat> Some of them are 312. But as you go, as you get to the 212, you know, change the underlayment if you want to do asphalt shingles. And most most people move to a membrane or to a metal roof. So I mean, I think I'm if you're talking about the metal barn and everything, I think 412 was was chosen because pre-manufactured buildings and metal roofing is typically lower than that. Good perspective. Yeah. So, so anyway, that, I guess that was my question for yeah. that. So that, and sorry, I, I have, I mean, there's one of my neighbors has more of a modern home mm -hmm. and I'm thinking, well, if they build a pool house for their pool mm -hmm. and want it to match their house, they couldn't because of this roof requirement, yeah. but because their roof is, but wouldn't yeah. it bother you? Yeah. Wouldn't it bother you to see their modern home and then the, yeah, then a four crafts roof over like, top of it. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. I would, you know, I like that we say, well, your accessory buildings need to match the house, but this, this one little requirement in here, I, I just thought is just weird because of that reason of the whole point of our accessory buildings, all of our code seems to wrap around 
somewhat of protection to the neighbor. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that lower means better. And so we, we shouldn't necessarily say, well, we have a roof, a minimum height requirement for a roof. You know, it seems to me for the reason of the code, it should be more of a maximum, yeah. which we have a maximum building height. So, and and we've kind of gotten way into discussion. Yeah, but this well, yeah, is a, we this is a legislative item yes. that will require. We've, we've discussed it well yeah. enough that the public can make good comments now. So, <laughs> uh, we'd invite the applicant up if they'd like to address anything before the public hearing. Commissioners, thanks for hearing me tonight. Um, Rick Scadden, I guess I'll say 118 Loman View Drive. Um, however, this is about 97 East, 3475 North. Um, it went down a little different than maybe it was described. There was some discussion. Uh, my neighbor actually put in a permit for a building permit for his pool house with a 112 pitch roof. And the permit was issued in error. And I'll, I'll own that it, they made an error. So we liked it and decided that we wanted to change it. There was discussion with an inspector and, and a process. And when we submitted, uh, if I may, I'd like to have, hand out. You okay with that? If I walk around? Hand them, you have to leave them. They'll, leave, they'll, they'll be part of the public rec or permanent record. So if you'll... Leave them here, they stay here. That's yeah. okay. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. Thank you. It is for the pool house behind my home. The other pictures of the of, are of the actual structure. Um, a few things. I know you, it's hard to legislate the fact that you can't even see my pool house from any neighbor's house. Um, it's behind my house, sits down below. The, the biggest reason is when I'm standing in some of my rooms, I don't want to deflect from my view over the city. That's the beauty of the lot I have. And this became a better option for us to still enjoy more of the city. And agreeing with Commissioner Thomas's comments, I would really believe that a 10-12 pitch on a, on a building would be far more uh, disadvantaged to my neighbor, regardless of the height restrictions, because I have a two-acre lot, and I would be able to build a bigger building than some. But I, I just feel like um, maybe a discretion to give building department more opportunity to I don't want to say pick and choose, but to, to make good decisions for permits on, on buildings that are extremely, uh, this building's going to have a metal roof, but I can promise you that metal roof's going to cost me way more than an asphalt shingle roof. It's, it's not a clary building, if you will. Um, so I, I think it's a decision that could give the building department uh, a broad range of making decisions when buildings come before them for permitting. And I think it's a decision that uh, what could be very uh, done in well in good taste and good design, and would actually at times be a better option for the neighbor than than a pitched roof that would block more of the view. That's what I have. If you have any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer. Or any questions for that? Well, I'm in. I'm in favor of changing the. So we're still in a public hearing. Yeah. Well, we need to open the public hearing. Well, I'm just, okay. I'm, I think the pool house is, is a lovely design. I'm in favor of changing the, the roof pitches. Uh, <clears throat> I think, I think part of the battle going forward is, does it match the home? Cause that is not up for discussion today. And just as Eric was saying, the, the modern house behind him getting legislated to have a, a 412 pitch is bothersome. Uh, if we have in our city code that the, the building needs to match the home, I think, that's a, I think that's a secondary discussion that's coming forward for the project. So I think uh, bringing this forward, voting, voting to, a, to amend the roof pitch is 
is fine and dandy, but um, it doesn't match the home. And I think that'll be the the next thing you're going to have to. So what have a commissioner, what the code, what the code says, and this has been, it, this is hard to administer at times. It says must be integrated into the design of the residential building with similar residential exterior wall colors, roofing materials, including metal roof shall have a similar color as the main building. So it really comes down to the colors, you know, it, is it similar? It's, if, if this is clad in a natural material or something that's along those same earth tones, like we, we have a really hard time saying no. And private property rights in Utah is sanct generally, you know, so we, we do our best to make good interpretations, but I, I, I would agree with you other, but the code is, it's open enough in my opinion that, you know, who's going to make the call on whether this does or doesn't yeah. match. And it's not, it doesn't have to be like a perfect one for one. It doesn't say architectural style, roof pitch, all these other elements. So well, I think that's helpful because I, I think it's, I think the general issues. topic at hand is, is amending the ordinance, but I think the, the real issue, I, I think that that kind of solves the, the issue of, of aesthetics. If it's going to be clad or something similar to the home, I guess I just don't want to vote to change the roof and send someone out to come back in to do the other things. to do the other yeah, good call. part. Well, so that's I the may, reason I'm even bringing it up. I and if I may, the the pool house is going to have the exact rock that the uh, home has on it, along with some of the matching siding, color wise. And there's also metal clad roofing in sections of my roof that I have now that would be a match as well. How big is the building itself not 20 by 10 it's exact so the, the foundation area spot is, is 20 by 10. Okay. i just looking at it, i thought well does that even meet our 200 feet i was mm -hmm. thinking it was smaller yeah so. we we did put the cantilevered roof out to to have a covered deck area to sit under when you're bald you don't love the sun as much as others so uh <laughs> as long as we're not sending someone out to go to go to battle again you know yeah. i just wanted to bring up yeah thank you that point, so point. the yeah. second you know the real reason you know the applicant was here so okay thank you let's open up the public hearing we'll now have our public hearing for zone text amendment 2024-5 to amend north Ogden code title 11-9m-8d4 accessory buildings to remove the required 412 roof pitch for accessory buildings over 200 square feet in floor area. Public hearing is now open. If you'd like to address us, please step up to the mic, state your name, and we'd be happy to hear from you. If you're online, just raise your hand in the chat and we'll let you in. Uh, uh, Chairman Thomas, you can see on the screen in front of you in the top right hand corner, there is oh, a little man. hand there, but oh, you'll be man. able to view and call on people during the meeting. Hey, look at that. That's cool as well. Okay. We have a public, Philip, go ahead. We'll let you talk. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, wonderful. Thank you all for your service to our beautiful commu our community and, and uh, all that you do to keep the community as wonderful as it is. I, along with many of the comments that have been made tonight, support creativity. I agree that we need to, as limitedly as possible try not to as much as possible try not to legislate aesthetics um, as has been pointed out one person's aesthetics is another person's garbage and so you know recognizing private property rights i think should be paramount i think uh, the comments that the roof pitch really doesn't matter is spot on uh, and I'm all for changing the code. However, we are a community of rules and a community of laws. And this is the second case in the last couple of months where we are looking as a city at changing an ordinance for an individual who knowingly built an accessory building out of compliance with existing code and then comes to the city asking for forgiveness and asking that the code be changed so that they're now in compliance. I agree again that the code needs to be changed and roof pitch isn't that important. But I think it is important that the proper process in the city be maintained and, and reinforced by the commission and later on by council. If there's 
something in a code, a building code or whatever that needs to be changed, the the time to press for that change is before you begin your permitting process, before you are agreeing to follow the existing code and, um, and get the code changed and then begin your building process. The, the process of acknowledging the code, agreeing to abide by the code, and then ignoring the code and asking for the code to be changed so that I go back into compliance is not the way things ought to be done. Um, I would recommend that the commission vote not to make this change uh, as it's being done right now in order to bring an individual into compliance. Um, and I think better processes are available and should be followed. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Any other public comment? Being there's no more public comments, entertain a motion to clo <clears throat> close the public hearing. I move we close the public hearing. I'll second that. <laughs> we have a motion and a second to close the public hearing. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, uh, before we begin discussion, would the applicant like to get up to speak to anything or you don't have to? I guess the only thing I would counter with, um, I don't know Philip's last name, so I will be respectful to calling Philip. Um, a permit was issued to design a building just like we did and we followed that. Um, and I've I've admitted that um, we find out now that that was a mistake. But you know, if it's issued for one, uh, you would anticipate that it would be issued for two. But uh, that's the only thing I would add. I, I do feel it's important for the aesthetics of these things to match the home, which we're we're uh, going to do, um, and the roofing material is also on my uh dwelling as as much so uh, all all of the uh, aesthetics of the building will match the the home that's being built there too but thank you thank you thank you all right discussion thomas if you have any questions on that so that we i mean in a there were a number of building permits but his neighbor who has a flat very flat roofed house accessory building came in the building permit was issued it was not you know we're people are fallible and it was not caught during the review process, issued the permit and then the change happened. So I, you know, there's so, definitely a chain of like an order of how things have happened here. Um, so we'll just point out that, you know, staff isn't without making mistakes, but those sins of the past, we can't just, well, we screwed up once, so we apply it to the next one and yeah. it gets caught on the next one. And you know, that happens from I'm not, to time. I'm not too worried about that. I mean, to, yes, but 90% of the time when we're making changes to code, it's because, something's come up and you know albeit the last time we did this that uh, our public was commenting on i would agree that 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 was out of the realm of you know fitting within our code you know mm -hmm. far as setbacks are concerned and those things um when we have something that we're changing and we don't know why it's there to begin with that's a different albeit however it, it comes to our attention but I'm definitely not one that's saying, well, just because this happened this way out of spite, we need to say no and then turn around in three months, change it because it doesn't make sense anyway. Um, but the, however we get to the point that where it is brought to us is how it is. You know, it, it could easily be in however many months when the neighbor who had a permit to do the building and the inspector denies certificate of occupancy because they realize that the accessory building doesn't meet our code. And then all of a sudden we're back before us and saying, the applicant saying, well, you issued me a permit and say, oh, well, we screwed up. We shouldn't have, you know, are we then saying, oh, well, we're still sorry. We're not giving you, we're not going to change it now because our staff screwed up. Like to me, that's not a reason, although it is a valid point because it, it, it does, it is 
a little bit frustrating sometimes when we when we're addressing things after the fact yeah. that and I don't feel like this is I don't feel like this is the same situation as before to my understanding before the guy knowingly mm -hmm. said so, he couldn't do it and did it anyway mm -hmm. <laughs> in my opinion my opinion a violation of process or, or whatever is not an is not a reason to approve something it's also not a reason to deny something if it's the correct legislation to begin with right so where i don't think we should ever be swayed by well hey, hey this guy's halfway through his his building so now do we need to change the code even if we are uncomfortable with it i don't think we should ever be swayed in that way but i don't i do think it would be kind of vindictive to to feel good about the the change texture uh, like the text change and then not apply it because of a certain situation so I, I i can agree with those comments to an extent but i can't take it all the way um Although, you know, I, I do remind people that when they do violate procedure like that, you're taking a dangerous gamble. You know, you could come here and easily be declined and be denied. I don't feel like this is which something I would, done. which we have done. Yeah. And yeah, and I, I could think of a number of situations. So it's a dangerous, dangerous gamble, but um, I don't think it's a reason to, to deny something. Yeah, I think it's going to, I think it's going to simplify things uh, for the city and for the citizens, you know, removing one you know, onerous, you know, checkbox of, of roof pitch that is not, you know, outlawed in code or anything like that. And if the, if the applicant was the only one to benefit from the change, then I think we, I think that would warrant some more discussion, but I think more than just the applicant are, are going to benefit from, you know, more freedom to, to pursue the aesthetic or, or cost effective measures or whatnot with their accessory building. So I don't, I don't think we're re rewarding bad behavior as much as we're we're focused on what's the point and, and is this going to make it you know easier for like i said for everyone the city and for homeowners and, and residents moving forward to just go do an accessory building i think i think right now even that is is it's quite a process just to get an accessory building and and it that has costs associated in and of itself so you know the the city the city made a goof because it's just it doesn't make sense to have this on the books <laughs> it wouldn't be something that you're used to to looking at what's the roof pitch you know so i think there's so many reasons to to move it besides um rewarding someone for you know going against permit drawings or something like that i had a neighbor tell me once it, north ogden city it's not that they don't want pool houses they just don't want crap yeah, no, I'm kidding. No. <laughs> but but I, I don't think I don't think a 412 roof pitch necessarily. Um, He's got a neighbor on every island. <laughs> okay, I, okay, I made up the last story. That wasn't. I didn't get the laugh I was going for. By the way, <laughs> tough crowd. Um, <clears throat> yeah, but uh, yeah, I don't I don't I don't think the roof pitch necessarily enforces our definition of of aesthetics, and I'm I'm in favor of this text change. Is that a motion? Make a motion. We approve the text changes written. I'll second that. We got a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Commissioner Nancaro? Yes. Commissioner Webb? Yes. Commissioner Mason? Yes. Commissioner Bailey? Yes. And I vote yes. That recommendation will be passed on to the city council, which will be heard either the end of the month or that sounds like not the first week of May. Is There's a meeting. It's the second week. Yeah, it's the second. Council meets the second and fourth Tuesday. Of the month. Okay. Is it only two? It's only two. They have a work session on the oh, first. Oh, they the still do a work Tuesday. session on that third one. Yeah, okay, but that's, that's not a decision. Is. Okay. All right. Item number seven, zone text amendment 2024-4, public hearing considering and recommendation on a legislative amendment to consider waterwise landscape amendment to Title 11 land use code. Presenter is Scott Hess. Scott. Thank you. So city council heard a presentation from Weber Basin Water Improvement or Weber Basin Improvement District of which Pineview is a partner or subsidiary or they're a partner program. And that's who does about 50% of our irrigation, maybe 70% of the irrigation in the city is Pineview until you hit a certain elevation level and then it's actually uh, married. It's a different water provider there. Um, we've gotten several inquiries from our community members about rip your strip program or other financial incentives for turning landscape over. And um, Weber Basin has one of these programs. The current program 
is $2.50 per square foot of lawn removed and replaced with water efficient landscaping. And that doesn't, that's not capped at just the park strip. It's no longer just the rip your strip program. It can be your entire yard. It's, it's really open, but there are some very stringent requirements for the homeowner as well as for the city on the application of those funds. So it, it requires the city to have an ordinance in place that says on new single family, multifamily commercial projects, um, no lawn can be in parking strips at all or areas less than eight feet in width. And that's now a state code not to require that no lawn goes in, but that cities cannot require you to put lawn in, in areas less than eight feet. So we couldn't have an ordinance that said, no, thou shalt have grass in your park strip. Um, this is saying, that's what we want to say, like that you cannot have it in there, but state code would preclude us from requiring it in those areas uh, less than eight feet. But that doesn't mean that homeowners don't opt to do that anyways as part of their own private property rights and landscaping they want to do. Um, also, no more than 35% of front and side yards can be landscaped in grass. Um, those lawn limitations don't apply to small residential lots with less than 250 square feet of landscaped area, which is a, that's a tiny little postage cool. stamp area. Um, and then in new commercial, industrial, institutional, and multifamily developments, uh, lawn areas shall not exceed 20% of the total landscaped area outside of actively um, utilized park spaces. So they'd have to have identified in their plan those programmable park spaces, we would call it, or, you know, areas you go kick a ball or throw a, you know, throw a ball, um, throw a Frisbee, whatever, you'd have to identify that. And you could probably pull that out as a, an improved park space. And then the remainder of the area couldn't be in lawn. Um, I've had several conversations since our work, work session on this one. Layton City's ordinance that I showed during the work session had the word may not shall on these requirements. And that's because it actually preceded the current program that Weber Basin's doing. That was when they had the, it was like $1.25 or $1.50 a square foot for park strip replacement only. And the requirements were just less stringent. They were just, it was like a foot in the door, basically. Um, Kaysville City's ordinance, and I've spoken with the Kaysville City Community Development Director, is written the way that they want the code to be written. And just anecdotally, I asked their community development director, how has that gone when admin administering it? And they said, it's been really difficult to administer. You know, private property owners come in, single family homeowners come in, and they, you know, they provide us with a site plan. We measure their impervious surface for stormwater. That's kind of like a fire life safety thing. We don't want to increase flood, um, flood possibility on properties. But outside of that and grading and retaining walls over a certain height and engineering requirements. So we, we do all the, the safety stuff basically. But then as far as if you want to put in rock, mulch, gravel, grass, uh, aerial sprinkler heads or drip systems, like we just, we don't have the time capacity, staff expertise, anything to administer that. So while I think this is a noble you know, request from Weber Basin. I think that it's certainly a worthwhile thing to put on the books. I caution you that the practical reality of administering this from staff is that it will be very hard to administer letter of the law and we'll do our best and we'll have those conversations. But I have a, I have a pretty strong feeling that if we get really hard on these, that you're going to get, you know, a wave of single family homeowners come back before here and say, um, you know, what if I want to have my front yard all in lawn because I have little kids and I bought a single family home because I want my kids to be able to play and run on the grass. I don't want it to be a rock garden. Um, but by this is the trade-off and this is some trade-off in from, you know, I had a call with Weber Basin too on this is that by having the rule on the books, it allows those, those good actors, the people who have existing large lot, single family that want to turn their landscape over and they want access to that, um, the incentive program, it allows them to have access to the incentive program. So without us having the ordinance on in place, we really can't extend that to our residents, but by having it in place, there's going to be a question for the planning commission for code enforcement for the building department of, you know, how heavily do we enforce this one requirement? Because our, our job is administrators of the code. We don't make the code. We don't interpret the code. We administer it as it is written, and that's what we will attempt to do. Um, but I think it's—I think we're in a painful transition point at this point uh, with all the waterwise landscaping and requirements and um, acceptance that we really are in a high desert area. 
So with that, I leave it, I leave it to the planning commission. We have a really good draft ordinance. Kaysville's is we would effectively number it into our ordinance where it would fit. And it's pretty well written based right off of the template. Um, and those are the key points. You know, we would be limiting 35% of front and side yard landscaping to grass. Anything that is not in grass is required to be a drip system, you know, full irrigation system, no aerial sprinklers. Um, and we don't, we don't, it, well, we don't administer certificate of occupancy for single family homes based on landscaping being in. We do with commercial, with, with commercial and a multifamily. Um, I go out and I do an inspection and I make sure that it matches the landscape plan as was approved by the planning commission. So those are a lot easier to administer, honestly, but it's the single family homes. What happens, you know, post uh, certificate of occupancy and that next 12 months when they're required to have their landscaping in, there's no follow-up inspection that we've built into our processes. And honestly, with two planners and um, you know, two and a half building inspectors, we just, we, I don't think we have the capacity to do it. And I, I think we should, I, I would hope that we were based in Pineview and our secondary water providers begin to realize that and maybe they staff themselves up to assist in the kind of the review or the policing of, of how this landscaping goes in. Does that credit apply to new install? Oh, no, it doesn't. So only, only replacement. Yep. So you're new, you're, you're requiring all. They want home. us to require restrictions on new install in order to be able to give credit for people to replace old. Right. Yeah, I, I think yep. we should wait. Yeah. I think that's Again, a bunch I, of I, crap. I, I think it's a wait and see what happens <laughs> in the future thing. I don't think we should put extra work on staff. I don't yeah. think we should require our new folks. It's going to be there. And it's just placing these mandatory restrictions on what people can do with their property. Yep. I don't like it at all. Yeah. Well, let's, any questions for Scott before we do the public hearing? Let's go ahead and open our public hearing. Public hearing is now open for Zone Text Amendment 2024-4, public hearing for consideration and recommendation on a legislative amendment to consider water-wise landscaping amendment to the Title 11 Land Use Code. Public hearing is now open. If you'd like to address us, please step up to the... Mike can do so, or if you're online, I can now see if you raise your hand. Mm -hmm. We'll call on you. Okay. I move we close the public hearing with no comments. Okay. Second. We have a motion and a second to close the public hearing. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, discussion. I think I'm I'm with what we talked about. I, I'm a developer, as you guys know, and I see the water companies from a developer standpoint, they keep making restrictions on what people can use their water for, but they've never reduced the amount of water that's required to turn over to them from a development standard. So to give an example of, let's say it's two acre feet of water that needs to be turned over to somebody for per residential home. Then we put a code in that says you can only landscape X amount of that land. Well, the water company has never reduced the amount of water they've been given. What it enables them to do is stretch that water further, which I agree needs to happen. But to me, if they want to do that, then they need to show some give on the other side as well of saying, hey, we want to reduce water all around. If you can do your development at this less requirement from a developer standpoint, then we'll require you to turn over less water. And then those restrictions can begin. Um, I, I feel like it's, they've found a way to advance what they're doing and stretch the water further, which we need to do. I'm in full agreement of that. The way they are keep trying to go about it, I don't feel is the right way because it puts the burden on the city to say, hey, you need to put rules in to manage this water for us. And I'm totally in favor of putting something on the books that on, in the land use code that would require a change for them to get a credit, but only as it applies to them applying for a credit, not mm -hmm. across the board saying, oh, we're gonna change these restrictions. So now people who wanna change their landscaping um, can get that credit because it costs more money to do zero scape than it does land sod. Mm -hmm. And so if they wanna incentivize people then they should incentivize them from the beginning and not a replacement. I was thinking adopting a, a poorly written pro program like this just encourages it and, you know, and us not adopting it uh, 
put some pressure on to change and make the program better. And, and, you know, you want to incentivize rip and replace curb. Okay. Get a better program. <laughs> like doing this, this isn't the way to go about it. Therefore I move, I move that we recommend to the city council that the city council uh, not adopt this legislation. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. Any other discussion or reasonings to support the, uh, you no. know, one, one comment that was made was um, uh, also about, you know, how, do, how are children going to play and, and things like that. I, that one was on my mind as I was reading through this as well. Well, you know, um, limiting grass as, as much as we need to save water, but limiting grass and replacing it with rocks only makes that problem worse when we, we come in tighter. You know, if you, you don't even have a couple hundred square feet to kick a ball on and, and it's, uh, it's over gravel, that, that makes the problem that was said here tonight about density even worse in my opinion and so yeah, and, i'm not in favor of this and i'll just add just from from my professional perspective um we we hinted on this last time when there were several commissioners absent it it scott you know talked about uh you know the city doesn't have the means to enforce it but you know the other side of this is the program would require new builds and <clears throat> it would require new builds to have a grading plan and a landscape plan to submit for a building permit for a residential building permit. And just in my experience, those are, they're typically a thousand bucks a piece, you know, might be six, 700 bucks, but what we're really doing is we'd be asking <clears throat> the existing citizens to fund more staff to enforce this. And then we'd also be, asking anyone trying to build in North Ogden to pay a couple thousand dollars more extra just to get a building permit. Mm -hmm. Good point. Okay. Commissioner Mason. Uh, yes to the, yeah, I, I vote yes to the motion made that we recommend they do not approve it. Yes. The motion on the table is to uh, mm. no, uh, denial of the To recommend denial. Yes to the no. So yes to the no. Commissioner Bailey? Yes to the no. Commissioner yes. Webb? Yes to the no. Commissioner Nancaro? Yes to the no. And I vote yes. Do the no. Our city council back there, he's laughing at us. <laughs> I'll, I'll take those notes to the meeting. All right, our administrative items. Number eight, site plan review 2024-4, consideration and action regarding administrative application for site plan approval of the North Ogden City Police Station and Senior Center parking lots located approximately 505 East, 2600 North. Presenter is Scott Hess. Scott? Yep, thank you. Um, I was not here, I was, I was out of town when this was presented the first time, so I apologize if I get it wrong how it was recommended, but I believe there's a recommendation for approval, but there were some concerns with the pedestrian access from the parking lot to the front door of City Hall. Um, if you, you know, you walked down the sidewalk over here and they've been running all sorts of machines and shaking the building and getting this side work, this uh, parking lot prepped over here, um, there's a significant grade change. Like on every quote flat piece of property in North Ogden, I don't know that there really is a flat piece of property in North Ogden. So from where the parking lot on the north side enters to where the sidewalk wraps around it on the south side is several feet. Of elevation change and you can see that when you're out there so staff did their best um went back and and revised this and we included um i think just you know honestly for like liability reasons we're not going to call it a, a true pedestrian pathway what we're doing is we're enhancing some hardscape landscaping through our landscape areas to um eliminate or reduce the the risk of what i would call a desire line and um, I wish that I knew who the quote was. It's a famous old architect and land planner said for every university, you should build the buildings and not build the sidewalks and let the students walk and then pave their desire lines, pave the pathways that they walk, because that is the most efficient way to get from building to building. And you see this where, you know, we try to pave the world flat and we try to pave sidewalks square and people are going to walk the path of least resistance. So what we've added here is a landscaping path from the parking lot in the direction of the main doors of City Hall. This is not designed to be ADA accessible. It would not designed to be likely even snow plow, you know, snow shoveled in the future. It's it's literally flagstones and pavers that are being laid out. But I think what it'll do in effect is 
reduce the number of trampled plants we have from the parking lot to the sidewalk to the existing sidewalk. And it's kind of the, um, you know, short of regrading and doing a, a really a bunch of heavy work to make an ADA accessible wheelchair accessible pathway in this area, this is a compromise. And so staff's presented this. And I think that was the only hanging item left on the approval of this site plan for the parking lots. Um, the site plan for the southern parking lot around the senior center, I don't believe there were any concerns or leftover items on that one. So we present that for planning commissions of um, acceptance, denial, change, you know, however you want to take it. But um, this is what staff has come up with. Okay. And the ramp on the other side is ADA accessible. It is. Yep. So as you come, you'd have two, two different ADA accessible points on the west side, the grade from the parking lot, well, it's not right next to the ADA accessible parking stalls. The grade will be pretty limited on that north side. When you come around the northern sidewalk, it'll be flat, you know, relatively flat how it is right now. Um, and then this is an ADA accessible from the parking lot up, although that will be, there will be some grade there, but it's not, I mean, it's just enough to hit the ADA slope requirements. Where this is, I don't, I don't remember the exact amount of feet. It's like three and a half feet of change of grade change between that sidewalk and the parking lot there. The parking lot will almost look sunken into the ground on that south side, but it's just because it's running effectively flat and everything else on our side is hilly. So the, the Fitzers off of the north east corner. Uh -huh. Is that city property? Is that the homeowner property? This is all everything you see on the site plan is city property. So the oh the um those that greenery. Yeah, those those fitzers there, those mm -hmm. oh well the existing that are on, on yeah. this picture. Yeah. Oh the ones that are there as a tangent, but I'm just curious. It, it's city. It's city, city property. Yeah. Okay. Do you want them? The spider bushes? You can come dig well, them out. I mean, if no, I don't want them, but if we're gonna <laughs> rip them out, it's a lot it'd be a lot easier to rip them out now. Yeah. Than I don't... it is when you have a parking lot there and you're yanking them across the parking lot. It's yeah. hard to get out. Right. Yeah, we have, we, there's a few things. One that I pushed really hard on and I'm, I'm glad that the city agreed with is when we started talking about this site as a whole, the pedestrian crossing um, directly across to 500 East that ha you've had to, you know, walk through the grass to pick up a flag to cross the road right there. That, that was a huge deal to fix that. Um, I wish that we had money built into this project to, you know, redesign all of the pedestrian accessibility to city hall and our city campus, but I don't, I don't think we do. So I'm not sure if that's part of the landscaping revisions that we're making now. And just a note, every, as you watch projects happen over the next several years for the city, everything the city is putting in is all waterwise landscaping. I don't think we're really putting in any um, turf grass unless it's a playing field park. So all of our improvements as we're pulling turf grass out, like at Loman View Park for the pickleball courts. Um, everything's and going back in. And credit because we just denied it. I know. <laughs> it's too bad. But we're all putting, we're, we're doing our best to <coughs> put in water-wise landscaping as it comes back in. But I'll ask, I'll ask Eric that question on whether or not we're ripping out those. He is online. Oh, does he want to answer? I think so. Yeah. I think I might hear a side <clears throat> to nowhere. I like that. See if Eric wants to talk. You just can't do it without this face. Hey, can you hear me? Yep. yep. Uh, the plan was was to we were not going to rip those out. We were going to just basically go along um, <clears throat> the asphalt and add some curbing. So I guess there will be some removal, but we weren't planning on taking out the whole thing. Is, is that what you're kind of wanting is to pull those out or just just curious just curious don't have an opinion one way or the other okay yeah that, that the, the plan was not to um at, at this point but but that's something we can explore as we um it'll be as we move along the project along that part. Oh, that's right thanks eric any other discussion on this or questions well, pretty much meets what we talked about last time. Make a motion that we approve the site plan subject to the conditions listed in the staff report. Second. 
got a motion and a second. Kind of quiet second. <laughs> I'll second that. There you go. <clears throat> Use your big boy voice. I usually do. It's usually uh, <clears throat> All right. Commissioner Nancaro? Yes. Commissioner Webb? Yeah. Commissioner Mason? Yes. Commissioner Bailey? Yes. I vote yes. All right. Uh, item number nine, site plan re review of 2024-6. Consideration and action regarding an administrative application site plan approval of the North Ogden City Waterworks Park located at approximately 346 East Pleasant View Drive. The presenter is Ryan Nunn. Ryan. Thank you. Um, yeah, just to start. So uh, this park, I believe, has been in uh, been a plan of the city's for a little while. Uh, it's going to be on the old public works site. Um, which is which is zoned our our civic is our civic zone, um, so it's a perfect use because parks parks are are part of that. Um, the some of the we, we could look at some of the exciting things about this with the waterworks is some of the amenities that will be there. Um, I, you know, there's a spring that runs through here, so it'll allow people to to really experience that spring water coming through some of the, uh, if you notice there's the, the square, um, it'll have those pumps for the, for the public to use um, as well as with pavilions and then this sidewalk. What's uh, the pitch on that pavilion? <laughs> I'm kidding, I don't care. <laughs> um, yeah, and then a, a sidewalk that uh, encircles the pump house there. Um, if you notice, there's some access for, for equipment to reach that. And, and all of this will be fenced with a six foot fence um, and sliding. We, part of it will be, there'll be some parking, off street parking provided, uh, about eight stalls and then any any overflow can can be parked on the the public works there right right by the the old firehouse building um, and then as well as included is there'll there'll be AD access crossing that street and then reaching over to the bicentennial park as well. Um, yeah. This project is is a uh, is related to the the Century, Century Farms development. Uh, land is being donated as well as funds, and then the city is is pairing that with our our ramp funds. Um, but but this yeah. is a public park in the civic zone. Yes. So this um, this is a is on the city side. So, so why are we city, fencing it? The city property is right. Yeah. On the edge of the building, so right. we're getting a little bit of property from Century Farm. We've we've fenced. I think all of our parks are fenced to some degree. Um, so we have chain link fence surrounding almost all of them. This one, because of the proximity of the waterworks park itself to Pleasant View Drive, there'll be a front yard fence, a three foot tall fence along the front as well with bollards to try to protect or you know reduce the number of kids that dart out, out in the road right there. But all of our fences or all of our parks are uh, fenced. Okay, but did I hear we're putting a chain link fence around the park, mm -hmm. circumventing it? Like Basically around all park, like a prison. It's a, it is like all our other parks. Like all our other parks, you just don't realize it because they're I so think, far away. Isn't and there's an ordinance on the books that a pool. This isn't a pool. This is a splash pad. <laughs> I hate the fence. I mean, I don't know if I'm showing my cards here or not, but like that fence is vomit, in my opinion. I, I hate fences. I think that. I mean, I, I I respect them for situations like when we have animals and farm equipment and safety, but for a park, um, you know, it's. I don't like it. I'm probably going to lose this battle, but I do not want, I don't know, like a fence there. Um, yeah. Is your neighbor? I don't know. I, had a fence and they <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how my neighbor feels. I know how, I know how I feel about there. a chain link fence around a park and I think it's yeah, a chain link fence feels a little. Yeah. I mean, a park yeah, should right. be an open place you walk through and, and, uh, chain links uh, better than, than vinyl to me, but I mean, yeah, no, vinyl's worse. I agree. We we both know okay. on chain link we're getting vinyl wrap chain link. Well, I, I, are we in the part of the discussion to discuss this? I don't like the fence. Sorry, if sorry. This is an administrative item. It's not a public hearing, so you're welcome to discuss or ask questions of Ryan or 
Eric is Eric is our city engineer who's if in effect the applicant. I mean, Eric designed the park and has been the one who's helped locate yeah. the water waterworks park and stuff. So I would encourage him to be a part of the conversation if there's specific questions. I, I think this park's fantastic, by the sure. way. Sure, yeah, I can agree with every all of that. Uh huh. Yeah, and and I think it alleviates some of the concerns of hey, if we're going to put density in this area, where are these kids going to go and play? And I, I love I love everything about this park. I hate the fence. Yeah. I think I think it I think I'll, it. I'll tell you what. If they'll close Pleasant View Drive, <laughs> I will fight to get the fence gone. I, I, I think I think when we talk about home values and things like that, that emotion that, that we discussed. Drive yeah, but I wanted Shoop to be here and mm -hmm. tick me off. I, I think I think putting a chain link fence around that park. I think an open park enhances the area. I think a chain link fence makes it look like a prison. That's my solid stance. And uh, you guys can go ahead and disagree with me. Can we do Disneyland leashes for each of the kids who are playing? <laughs> Just to hook them up to a leash. Run you know, as it comes to the fence, um, I'm assuming this the water's running seasonally on this splash pad. Yeah. Right, like Memorial Day to Labor Day or something like that. Yeah, correct. And then are there hours where it closes and the water shuts off, or is it just running all the time <laughs> during the summer? Um, if if I may. You're um, the shoot. Okay, perfect. Hey, so um, if I may go back to the fence. Uh, so I would suggest the fence, at least on on uh, a couple sides. The east side borders our, our public works site, which we're not doing a whole lot with. Um, and that would give some delineation of, of if we have equipment or things like that that, we, that we're putting in there. I would suggest the fence on the east, on the east side. And then on the south side, uh, that borders Pleasant View Drive. Uh, the plan was to put a three and a half foot uh, chain link fence, and this would be a black vinyl uh, coated chain link fence. Uh, and the slats, um, I was going to put at least on the east side. That way, it would kind of hide the the current public or the old public work site, and kind of I guess not detract from the the park. Um. The and then the water, we uh, it, it 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 will run basically basically Memorial Day until yeah October or or thereabouts. So it's just a spring that will come in and it will go into underground tanks. And so the only way that the water comes to the surface in this park would would be when kids actually pump the water out of these tanks. Um. And then they would go into these troughs and this different, um, this water lab is what they call it. And so the kids are able to make this, make the water do different things and go different paths. And then it would go into the storm drain. So it wouldn't go very far, it, it, maybe 40, 50 feet at the most that the water would travel before it would go back underground. Thanks, Eric. That's a great explanation. Would you like to leave the park open to heavy equipment and the public works too? <laughs> you, I, 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 I don't. I don't. I'm kidding. I'm gonna. I'm gonna back. I'm not gonna back off my comments, but I'm. I'm may, I may lose them. Okay, but I don't like. I don't appreciate chain link fences around the city. I think there are way too many in the city. I've been in other communities, mostly out of state, because I think our whole state's in love with with fencing. Um, and again, I, I have a fence around my backyard, so. Like and I put it in, and then it's a chain link fence. So don't let me be too hypocritical. But um, you know, I've driven around other places, and and then they allow just meandering yards to come together and, and things like that. You know, um, obviously when we have farm animals and heavy equipment, I think we need to chain link that. When people have dogs and things that need to be kept in, but I see no purpose to to put a chain link fence around a just to just to say this is mine and this is the definition of the park. I think that's stupid. When and when we want people to walk in and out of there freely. My two cents. Mic drop. Yeah. Yeah. No, and, 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 and that's totally fine. Uh, I, I mean, I agree to the sense I, fences are annoying, but at the same time, to make sure people are coming and going in the park in the areas that we want them to come and go is probably critical. I do like the fact of putting a fence along Pleasant View just for the fact of keeping kids off from running that's access to the road. But, uh, you know, Maybe that west side, as it as it develops into the 
the park of Century Farms. I think their open space and park there, maybe something there could be looked at of the necessity if we need to or not. But again, it may be they may want it because they don't want people from the park coming into their yeah. their space. And but, we uh, definitely want to not have a fence there so that the kids run amok in the new development. <laughs> yeah. It's a requirement. Well, they'll be the number one users of this park. So yeah. we, we did hear evidence that people in that area smash fences and gates, yeah. right? <laughs> we, we heard that tonight, right? Yeah. <clears throat> Anything else? Dog the... over with the kids. Yeah. Yeah. Any any other comments or it's it's probably worth noting just because it was a really good public private partnership that brought this project to light is that the Century Farms rezone and the development agreement required a significant cash match. It was a hundred thousand dollars. It was required oh. from the developer and they but let's, kind of regardless of what's happening on yeah, the zoning. Yeah, I was going to say, let's be clear, that was the past zone. Not it, this, it was, but that zone. that commitment but, has been met, will be met, and is what allowed us to, to obtain the Weber County Ramp Grant funds to build this. So it's just, it's worth noting that the commitments made on that past project will be seen through and this park will get built. And that, of course, may change its configuration, whatever, you know, council decides on that. But um, it really, this this is the outcome of a really good private public partnership and yeah, that's a in our significant opinion. thing to note. It is. You know, you can't get those ramp <clears throat> funds without a matching grant. And that's two hundred thousand dollars that can go to something that kids will use. Right. Yeah. Well when we talk about developers that we'll say live up to their word or trying to make sure something's good in the community. Yeah. You know, that's been done based on their past requirement, not contingent on a favor of an adjustment. So mm -hmm. Since I would beat the drum on the fence so loud, uh, if the homeowners that abut the park want the defense, I obviously couldn't. Uh, you know, I wouldn't. I would understand that. I just yeah. don't. I just don't want us to just perimeter the fence just to say, okay, we're going to lock this thing up at 10 p.m. or whatever. But that may not be in my purview here. Anything else? Entertain a motion. Make a motion that we approve the site plan subject to the conditions listed in the staff report. Do you want to add any, should I add anything about the fencing? Or? I, I don't know if I'm on fence island here or if anyone agrees with me. Um, so uh, and, and, and my passion, I hope, isn't swaying you guys' like, logic either. I, I, I'm really passionate about anti-chain link fence in the city. But, yeah, you know, vinyl dip is better. So don't let me pressure you guys just because i'm on the west side if that could be considered to be opened up i i'm yeah. supportive of that yeah but the children frolic you know yeah we could always fence it later yeah i just don't know as we need to come right out of the gate with a fence if i the would problem. say that probably that north side around the public works place and along pleasant view as they have proposed would be critical the west side as it potentially expands into a park with century can be a, leave it open open for later option yeah. yeah if the homeowners want it then yeah <clears throat> and it's a, it's only a three foot so moved or do i need to sure. repeat all that okay so moved eric's okay. busily taking I notes the so moved. we have a motion and a second commissioner bailey yes commissioner mason yes commissioner webb yes commissioner nancaro yes and i vote yes who seconded this commissioner yes. webb thank you all right uh we now will open up for public comments. If anybody would like to make a comment to the Planning Commission, please step up to the mic and do so at this time. Uh, commissioners, um, Carmen Sinone, Pleasant View Drive. Um, and I hadn't planned to do this, but I raise this issue only as a historical context and in case there is any unintended consequences. So we're on the record, so there can't be any unintended consequences. Back to item number nine. Are you sure that's a spring and not um, back in the late 70s or early 80s, North Ogden drilled in the illegal well right behind the public works department. The, what happened is it took the water from everyone on Loman View Drive and Pleasant View Drive who had wells, and they were forced to cap it. And so I want to make sure that this is actually a spring 
and that those of us who are still on wells won't lose any of our well pressure once this is running. And I, I just raised that again, so that down the road, our, we lose our well pressure. You can't say, well, that was an unintended consequence. We didn't know that. But um, and I, again, historical context, I just want to make sure I don't lose my well pressure. I already did that once before in the 70s. Obviously, we didn't have, we wouldn't have an answer to that, but that's so, well. What the point was well made. The yeah. water's coming out of the artesian well on Jerry Shaw's property, so it's an established water right. So it's an, it's his water right. Okay, that's been given to the city. That's what I wanted to make sure, so it won't affect my wells. It shouldn't, because that water's continually running. It's so, all the time right now. It's okay, sure. thank you. Thanks for bringing that up, and thank you for participating. It that history is important. So thanks for sharing it. Well, thank you. I've probably been here longer than any of you. <laughs> <laughs> longer than me. If there's no more public comments, we'll move on. All right, remarks from planning commissioners. Any? Yes. The old chambers had a small cabinet where sometimes crackers and treats were kept. <laughs> um, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, I was just wondering if that's... We can uh, maybe we can take we a can tour. Actually, for sure we can bring the fridge over. Okay. And then we do have the, that's my the treats are just package. behind two locked doors. Okay. That <laughs> been good to know I may or may not have keys to. Okay. Oh, All right. Nice. Okay. Let the record show. I was gonna say it, it looks he like you have had dinner tonight, but he was thirsty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that's right. Really yeah. That's why this side of the room never motioned anything. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other comments? Uh, Scott? I just wanted to note that um, Ryan, Ryan Nunn and I are fortunate enough in a, about two weeks or uh, actually next week and the next week to go to Minnesota to the National American Planning Association Conference. Um, that one is typically, there's several thousand people who go to, it's a huge draw. They're holding the conference over the weekend. And the only reason I can think that is that it, it won't impact you know, thousands of cities across the country's planning commission meetings. That's honestly the only <laughs> thing I can think, but we are in the conference on, on, dang it, <laughs> on Saturday, Sunday, uh, Monday, and first part of Tuesday, and then we'll be back. So we'll bring a little report back of what we learn. And um, I know of a few dozen other Utah cities and people who are going. So looking forward to having a little group of folks from Utah there at national for conference for your boss. I, I really appreciate that. We, our city allows you guys to be trained in that way yeah. and that we don't try to cut funds right. by taking that out. I think that's important to develop professionals and, and I appreciate having professionals in the city. And I, I love that the city lets you guys develop your career in that way. I'm a big believer in those kind of conferences. Yeah, I yeah, completely I, agree. We're not spending money <clears throat> to educate the people in the city yeah. about what's happening out there, then we're falling behind as a city. I think that's money well spent and well managed. So I'm glad that you guys are willing to take your weekend and go and do that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So thanks to the city council and the city manager for allocating that and seeing that. Because that's that doesn't sell well to the public, right? Hey, we're they can be seen as a junket and all sorts of things. I completely disagree with that mentality. I think it's putting a good investment in the city. And I, I, that's just my two cents. Thanks. Having had the opportunity mm -hmm. to go to a national planning conference in the past, um, just the, the value, you know, of the continuing education programs, but just interacting with the, the other um, cities across the nation and mm -hmm. similar issues that we have, you know, national yeah. legislation going on. It's, it's extremely valuable. I agree. Thank you. That's all I have. John? I was going to say, I wish you would have been there at our three o'clock meeting where we were talking with the Citizens Budget Committee, where we were talking about this. And um, they they were a little skeptical, but uh, Scott was able to share that same feeling about would, how important always, it was. I would attend those anytime if I would have known about it. I've come down before and advocated that, that you know, for we've had public stand up and say you know i haven't had a raise in five years why should city employees get one mm -hmm. and okay fair but i i can counterpoint that all day yeah. and so yeah and and so but that is a new process we've started the last couple of years and so if you're interested in seeing it it's on youtube same same bat channel um that we have with everything else and so um you can look you can watch those and we kind of march through the different departments and talk about specifics and 
Yeah. Uh, today we were talking about administrative departments and those will be presented to the council on Tuesday. So, and, and those meetings are up on our meetings and agendas page, which can be accessed through the little clock icon on the homepage of northogdoncity.com. So if you want to watch when those happen, they typically precede planning commission meetings at three o'clock on Wednesdays is when that citizen budget committee has been. That way there's an ending time and they can't <laughs> run long because <laughs> we used to share a room, not anymore. So speaking of that, as you guys are like looking at training topics, things like that, I think you know, these things got to be paid for, you know, and, and so training that could educate us as a commission about, you know, just some basic best practices of how to view planning and growth through like a fiscal mindset. Like, you know, I, I think we could, we would benefit from that some education, just being pragmatic. I don't say like things like, well, the developer builds the roads and things like that. But I think that there's probably some basic education. Well, that same conference that he was, he, the national conference, there's a Utah one mm -hmm. that's, that's, they alternate between Northern Utah and Southern Utah, like yeah. every other year. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've attended it in Salt Lake and, and in, in Moab before, and it was, yeah. Yeah. And maybe and have some of those more same. group stuff that would look at yeah. the budget and, you know, ground us in, because I think sometimes we're looking at it from what citizens say and things like that. But I, I think if we want to be good planners, we need to be grounded in the budget and we need to be thinking about like, well, what's pragmatic? How, how can we sit here and make recommending decisions that are actually pragmatic to happen? Sure. You know, because yeah. if we don't, if we're not seeing that, that progress is going to happen, whether we plan for it or not. And if we don't look at it from a pragmatic perspective and, and counterbalance a developer or something like that coming in, then we're, we're kind of missing the boat. Okay. Um, and the, the APA conference is down in Cedar City this fall. It's in the middle of May, so I can get those dates for you. We do have, we have had a pretty healthy training budget. So if there is anyone planning commission wise who's interested, I can look at what we have on the balance of our training budget and see if we can send you. Typically, I think what we try to do, I, th I know you all went to Moab in 2020 in February, just before everything shut down for COVID. That was the last conference that I had attended as well. Um, but we had in our budget now, we are gonna budget for everybody to attend the Northern Conference, which is typically held in the fall. So it was in Ogden last fall, and I'm not sure where it is, but it, it happens usually somewhere between um, like Payson and Brigham City as the Northern Conference. And then from that point, South is the springtime Southern Conference. But I'll send those dates out. And if anybody can attend, I know that's a big lift for planning commission members, but we'll help you, you know, get there, your hotel and your registration. And if you're interested, I'll see if we have funds. Okay. Anything else, John? Uh, two things about the room. Uh, the doors to your right that have crash bars on them are exit doors. If you breathe on them, they will alarm. And 15 seconds later, they'll unlock and you can get into the hallways that will exit the building. Um, we do anticipate giving you uh, badges so that you can go through those doors to come in and out of the building um, and park in the secured area if you'd like um, or behind City Hall and come up the stairs. Um, and then the other one is these microphones are, are a little funny. They actually are quite directional, but if you, if you don't like them all the way up in your face, if you put them down, you can, we can still hear you really well, but they're not going to be in your eye line. Um, I noticed that they, when, is that, that, that microphone's the same way? Yeah. Yeah. I noticed when it was up here, I couldn't hear. And then down here I could hear. Yeah. So it's, it's partly because our voice is pushed down and then the, it'll bounce off the, the floor or the tabletop. So, but I will, I'll work on making sure we have treats next time. Um, and I think I'm, hungry we'll, all I'm for sure we'll just bring, we'll bring the fridge and the water here. over. Yeah. <laughs> You're wasting away. I, I had lunch at 1130. <laughs> oh. So. All right. We have a motion to adjourn. Come on, right side. Okay, south side. I'll make a motion. All right. <laughs> I'll second that. I have a motion to 